Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Montgomery County Council's Tuesday, April 27th session. I'd like to start by acknowledging the recent verdicts in the Derek Chauvin trial for the murder of George, George Floyd and the guilty verdicts reached by the jury. Despite the heart-wrenching pain of losing their loved one, the Floyd family channeled extraordinary strength over the past year in seeking justice, not only for George Floyd, but for Black people across our nation. We know that no guilty verdict will wipe away the suffering George Floyd endured or ever make the Floyd family whole again. But as Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison said, this is accountability, not justice. But accountability is the first step toward achieving justice. In Montgomery County, we've already taken a number of steps to reimagine public safety and more are on the, on the way. Uh, we have three presentations coming up. First, I'll recognize Councilmember Katz to present a proclamation for Cross Community Incorporated. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and good morning and welcome to all. And welcome to the um, county. And, and I, if uh, Ben Wickner can please, Pastor Ben, it's good to see you. Um, thank you to Pastor Ben Wickner and the executive director of Cross Community and members of his team, Faith Wang, Jay Han, Milagro Flores, Adama Harona, Edwidji Tabu, uh, and Isabella Wise for being with us this morning. Cross Community Inc. is uniquely connected and dedicated to the community it serves. COVID-19 hit zip codes 20877 and 20886 especially hard. Their neighbors have been disproportionately infected with COVID-19. They have lost their jobs and cannot afford to feed their families. Businesses have closed their doors. It should not surprise anyone that 77% and 72% of residents in these areas, respectfully, are people of color. In December 2020, <clears throat> under the leadership of Pastor Ben, Cross Community opened the doors of the Montgomery Village Resource Center, which, they also, which is also known as MVRC, along with an alliance of community partners, the MVRC provides access to life-saving services such as food assistance, mental health, domestic violence, COVID testing, housing, and rent assistance. Most recently, Cross Community mobilized to establish equity access vaccine clinics to ensure residents who have been hardest hit by the pandemic are able to walk on the road to recovery. Montgomery County thanks you for your service, to the most vulnerable in our community. And because of that, I have a proclamation, which I'm gonna read, and then I'm gonna ask Pastor Ben to please say a few words. This is a proclamation of the Montgomery County Council. Whereas COVID-19, an infectious disease caused by a newly discovered coronavirus was first detected in Montgomery County in March, 2020, and on March 5th, 2020, the state of Maryland declared a state of emergency. And whereas our community has suffered tremendously during this past year with our black, Latino and immigrant communities disproportionately impacted by the virus. And whereas Cross Community Inc. of Gaithersburg has been deeply engaged in COVID-19 relief work since the onset of the pandemic, meeting the needs of the most highly impacted and vulnerable in our community, and whereas through its Montgomery Village Resource Center, Cross Community Inc. has distributed fresh, healthy produce, staple foods, and other necessities to residents on a weekly basis, and served as a referral center for other social services, including mental health, domestic violence, COVID testing, housing and rent assistance, and whereas Cross Community Inc. mobilized its extensive network of partners to establish equity access vaccine clinics to ensure that residents who have been hardest hit by the pandemic are able to walk on the road to recovery. To date, more than 1,825 vaccines have been administered in partnership with the organization and 95% of residents vaccinated at the equity access clinics are people of color. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland hereby honors 
Cross Community Inc. for their remarkable assistance to 5,000 plus Montgomery County households to ensure access to resources and equity in the vaccine rollout during the COVID-19 pandemic. It's presented today and it's signed by Council President Hucker and by me. And thank you, thank you, thank you, Pastor Ben. And we'd like to have you say a few words as well, please. Well, good morning and thank you, uh, Council Member Katz and, and Council. We're very thankful for this honor. Uh, if I could ask my staff and community leaders, would you uh, show your cameras? I want I want the Council to be able to see you and recognize you. Uh, if you, anyway, if I could ask you to do that. We feel very privileged to be able to do this work, Council. It's, and it just means a great deal to us that you're, the partnership and help that you're giving to us to improve lives on the ground in these hard hit communities. Because, because that's what we do. We, we seek to bring high level, uh, government resources to the ground, to the grassroots. Because when you get to the grassroots, you find a lot of beautiful flowers there. And that's what we're trying to. We're cultivating that ground in the in the these communities, and that's that's what we do across communities. So what I want to do very briefly, I want to just highlight the people who make it happen. So cross community staff and community leaders, would you just raise your hand real quick? Okay, these are the people who are getting it done, folks. These are what we call our Jedi's. Okay, and that's not just a Star Wars reference. <laughs> it stands for justice, equity diversity and inclusion. These are our Jedi fighters. They're getting it done on the ground. And council, we just are so thankful for your partnership. We, we, we want, we need that continued partnership and support for this social enterprise work that we're doing to lift up these historically marginalized communities and make a difference. And I just wanna ask you to just, you know, invite you to reach out to me, reach out to us. We would love to help continue to do, grow this work. And so we're very thankful for this this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you to all who are helping you, Pastor Ben, and I will never think of the word Jedi the same way again. So with that, Mr. President, I'm turning it back over to you. Thank you. Mr. President, are you there? There you go. I am, sorry. Um, now we'll have a proclamation uh, to recognize Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month. Council Vice President Albernoz and our County Executive Mark Elrich are here to present it. Council Vice President. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm honored to be joined by the County Executive this morning. Also in the audience today, we have Odile Bernetto uh, from our Department of Health and Human Services, Kim Mayo, also from DHHS. And we also have Eldora Taylor, we also have Dr. Seth Morgan, Chair of the Commission uh, for People with Disabilities. We also have Rick Callahan, Co-Chair of Interact DD and the Executive Director of Compass, and Pat Ritter, Co-Chair of Interact DD and the Executive Director of the Treatment and Learning Centers. Uh, the Interact uh, and, and DD is an incredible coalition of organizations that have been so supportive of our IDD community uh, really, frankly, for generations, um, but in particular this last year. Today, we celebrate the over 6 million individuals in the United States that have a developmental disability. And it's so important for us to have a greater understanding of the challenges of this community, but much more important than that, to acknowledge and celebrate their talents and gifts and their contributions to our society economically and in every corner of our community. This year has been extraordinarily difficult and tragic for the IDD community. Persons with IDD were three times more likely to die of COVID-19 than the general population. And many of their families went months without being able to see or embrace their loved ones. I really want to especially acknowledge Dr. Mike Greenberg, um, work, who worked closely with our primary care coalition, the Commission for People with Disabilities, community-based organizations, and many others uh, to partner to address the numerous challenges. And I also want to acknowledge the Department of Health and Human Services um, who worked tirelessly as well, as well to provide PPE, training and testing and vaccination protocols that have literally saved lives. And so while this has been an extraordinarily difficult year, I in particular am extremely hopeful uh, that not only is the upcoming year going to be 
better than this past year, but we'll be able to build off of the many successes uh, that we've had collaborating together as a community. I now want to turn it over to our county executive to say a few words as well, and then I'll ask Dr. Seth Morgan to say a few words on behalf of the community, and then the county executive and I will jointly read the proclamation. Mr. County Executive. Yes. Thank you very much for letting me join you this uh, morning on this. Um, this is up close and personal for me. You know, we say that, uh, you know, we're highlighting DD Awareness Month because it's important to increase awareness and acceptance in our community of people of every ability. So I think, as a lot of people know, um, I have a, an adult foster son, and uh, I had, in 1975, um, I had him and another son who were both developmental, had developmental disabilities, they were Down syndrome. And I used to live up in Burtonsville and I used to play softball down in the leagues in Laurel. And I would bring my kids to the game and they were these really nice stands they built behind home plate. And when my kids would get there, they would go up in the stands. And in the beginning of the first year, the stands would empty out. The other adults who were sitting up there, sitting up there with their children, you know, watching their fathers play or their brothers play or, you know, loved ones play, um, they would leave the stands and leave my two sons sitting up there by themselves. It took maybe half the season before people began trickling back. And then by the end, realizing that they had nothing to be afraid of. That was the state of things in the early 70s, you know, the developmental disability, particularly folks with, um, you know, obvious profound disabilities like Down syndrome. Um, they were visible and people were nervous and people were afraid because for years they had been sheltered and put aside. So you know, I experienced that as a, as a young father. I, uh, and I saw a change and I realized how important it was because people would tell me how important it was and how much it affected them to have that experience and to realize they had nothing to be afraid of. And that always struck me so weird because there was nothing to be afraid of these children and yet people harbored these feelings. And so I you know, saw this up close and personal and it's absolutely most effective way to increase awareness is through everyone's willingness to learn, acknowledge each individual's contributions and to see these folks in the community as just other members of our community like everyone else. I'm acutely aware of, the va of valuing everyone's community and providing opportunities for residents with developmental disabilities to live as independently and productively as possible. And it's important that our community foster that. We encourage all residents to support all opportunities for individuals with development disabilities in our community and to access education, housing, employment, social and recreational activities. Montgomery County has a proud history of fostering an inclusive, inclusive community and increasing opportunities for individuals with developmental disabilities. For example, the county's provided additional funding to DD providers, providers for over 40 years now. And this funding supports agencies so they can provide services that help individuals with developmental disabilities thrive in our community. This fiscal year, the county is providing almost $18 million in funding to support our DD community. In addition to the ongoing supplemental funding, we know that individuals with IDD are particularly vulnerable to the effects of COVID and in FY21, the county executed a contract with the primary care coalition to provide technical assistance and support to DD providers during this pandemic. Montgomery County is proud to celebrate our developmental disability community this year and every year. And I'm proud of being in a county where we do things like this because we realize that everybody who lives here matters. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. County Executive. Extraordinarily well said. Uh, Dr. Morgan. Thank you so much. It seems like uh, I come to you all frequently uh, for awareness days, and I think that uh, uh, I'm very happy to serve that, that uh, role because I think awareness is extremely important. I do want to thank the County Council uh, specifically council member uh, Albernaz for the wonderful words and county executive Eldridge for his uh, wonderful comments as well. Uh, the issue of uh, awareness of developmental differences uh, is extremely important. And I'm gonna put a plea out there uh, to parents specifically. Uh, parents are the ones who are aware of developmental differences earliest. Um, 
You obviously go to see pediatricians or other care providers periodically, but in their uh, half hour or 45 minute uh, visits, they can't really get as much information as you as parents do. And one of the first things that, that you want as a parent is not to admit that your child is having a problem or an issue. Uh, and that's natural. You want to you want to just say it's fine. It'll all go away and, 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 and everything will be fine. However, it has been shown that early intervention uh, is extremely important and can actually have lifelong benefits to uh, children who are recognized early developmentally. Don't wait until they're three or five years old, but start uh, within the first year to, to get the assessments. Um, there are pediatricians who are specialists in diagnosing and treating uh, this disorder. And as I said, the earlier intervention is extremely important for ultimate long uh, life uh, uh, experiences of the child. Um, the, pe the people that I have met who have developmental disabilities uh, by and large are wonderful and I absolutely have uh, benefited from my interactions with them. But as a clinician, as a physician, I still feel that it's important that parents be vigilant and uh, not just ask your pediatrician uh, at the visit, uh, you know, is there something going on here? But actually, uh, perhaps take the next step. Uh, look at uh, uh, interventions and uh, uh, hallmarks of developmental delay uh, as parents and uh, perhaps ask for a referral to the uh, specific pediatricians who are trained to, to treat this. Uh, thank you again to all of you for this proclamation, uh, and I'm going to pass it back. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Morgan. I actually am going to ask Mr. Callahan to say one or two words. I know community-based organizations have just really stepped it up over this last year in particular. So just in, in a minute or less, Mr. Callahan, if you can uh, say a few words, we'd be honored. Thank you. Um, everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. So I want to thank the Vice Chair Arbanas, County Exec. Elridge, um, County Council members, all HSS staff on the on behalf of people with disabilities, their families, our heroic DSPs, we, we saw so much um, leadership and work over the past year, and the developmental disability community for this recognition. It's because of the support of the great county leaders that we can finally see the light at this very, very long tunnel. And I think I, all of us can say that we finally see hope and that we hope that this terrible pandemic is coming to an end. We're not quite there yet. I mean, still wearing masks, social distancing, doing all those things, but there is hope. And again, so thank you for this proclamation and awareness of everything that we do um, with people with disabilities and their families. Nailed it, uh, with 15 seconds to spare. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Callahan, appreciate thank you. you. All right, Mr. County Executive, let's read this proclamation together. Do you have it up? You're on mute. Okay. So I'll start. Great. Whereas Montgomery County is committed to achieving a culture of meaningful inclusion of individuals with developmental disabilities in all facets of life and. Whereas Montgomery County has a strong history of partnerships with the providers that deliver essential services to individuals with developmental disabilities so they can live their best lives in the community and. Whereas people with developmental disabilities have the desire to achieve personal success through education, meaningful work and family and community ties. They have the same hopes and dreams as all residents to be self-sufficient, work, earn a living, practice their faith and be included in their communities. And whereas Montgomery County is committed to recognizing that every person, regardless of perceived ability, has valuable strengths, infinite capacity to learn and make decisions, and the capability to make important contributions to their communities if given opportunities to do so. And whereas Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month is designated to raise awareness about developmental disabilities and highlight the importance of including people of all abilities in all aspects of community life. Uh, and I'll take us home. Uh, now, this, oh, sorry. <laughs> now, therefore, do I, uh, Mark Elrich as County Executive, Tom Hucker as our Council President, and myself as Council Vice President, 
uh, hereby proclaim March 2021 as Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month in Montgomery County and ask residents to join us in recognizing individuals with developmental disabilities and the tremendous contributions they make to our county's rich diversity. Thank you all so much. Congratulations and keep up the phenomenal work. Turn it back to you, Mr. Council President. Thank you all uh, for your tremendous work. Great to see everybody um, and please keep it up. Okay, and our third, third proclamation now is for uh, to recognize Fair Housing Month. I'll be joined by the Fed Committee, Council Member, Council, uh, uh, Fed Committee Chair uh, Hans Riemer and Council Members Jawando and Friedson. Fair Housing Month, is a celebration of the passage of the Fair Housing Act of 1968, which is a critical piece of legislation passed during the civil rights era to ensure how equal housing among residents. Today, we honor this crucial legislative milestone with a recommitment to fighting any and all discriminatory housing practices here in Montgomery County on the basis of race, color, religion, sexual orientation, national origin, or disability. Very proud to be joined not only by my colleagues, but by uh, Greater Capital Area Association of Realtors President Jan Brito, Director Jim Stowe from our Montgomery County Office of Human Rights, Frank Vitale from Maryland Legal Aid, and uh, the members of the Fed Committee. Uh, I think first we're going to, uh, let me turn it over to the Chair of the Fed Committee. Thank you, Mr. Council President. I just want to add to your excellent comments that this is a really important issue for us. We have worked diligently for years now, um, you know, on tenants' rights, on promoting fair access and, and quality housing, um, and also trying to change some of our policies to uh, open up more housing opportunities in our single-family neighborhoods through accessory dwelling units. Uh, we're considering the zoning changes, uh, as Councilmember Juwando has recommended, and I have a recommendation, and the Planning Board is going through that conversation as well. Uh, we have increased our our finance uh, our financial support for affordable housing production. So it's an enduring, um, you know, goal for us and an enduring work program for us. Uh, and at the core of it, it's about equity, uh, accessibility of housing, affordability of housing, and we've got a lot to do. So thank you, Jim, and and. Uh, for all of your work. I know your summit was a big success as it always is, and we'll we'll keep on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Jawanda. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'll just be very brief. I know we want to get rolling here, but uh, you know, core to any community is the ability to be housed in a uh, place that has a access to amenities, a great school, be able to afford it, something that is, is high quality. Um, and we know that for much of our history, that was denied to many. Uh, and, in, and in many parts of our country, through the legacy of these policies, you still have folks that uh, live next to abundance uh, and are denied opportunity to access fair, affordable, and high quality housing. And so this is a, an, an important commemoration, uh, but it's also a reminder uh, that we still have much work to do. And uh, Councilmember Reamer mentioned some of the things that we're all working on. Uh, and I recently introduced a more housing for more people proposal uh, to help keep people in their homes that are affordable and expand the type of homes we have missing middle. It's an ongoing conversation. There's so much to do uh, and really appreciate uh, Director Stowe, uh, Mr. Vitale, uh, our real estate community, uh, everyone who understands how important this is. So looking forward to continuing the work and, and uh, honoring uh, the, the work that's been done today. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember uh, Friedson. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to uh, offer my appreciation to Director Stowe in particular for all of your work, uh, implementing many of the uh, changes uh, that the uh, councils put forward, both this council and the prior council, uh, Mr. Vitale and uh, Ms. Brito and uh, all of our partners. Uh, that uh, help to make Montgomery County a more inclusive and welcoming place. This council has really stepped up. Uh, our Fed committee in particular has done a lot of work on housing issues to provide more access to more people to make Montgomery County a place that lives up to its professed values. And Fair Housing Month is a good 
opportunity for us to reflect on that. I think that the public conversation has uh, started to change of uh, what housing policies mean, uh, how we got here, uh, and how we move forward. And I know that we're going to be doing a lot of work as well, uh, in the months uh, and uh, years ahead to uh, answer those questions, to address them as best as we can, but appreciate the fact that we are uh, recognizing this important milestone today and appreciate everybody's efforts and hard work uh, on uh, what is fundamental to uh, a local government, which is uh, what kind of housing we provide uh, to residents and how inclusive and welcoming a community we are. Thank you. Director Stowe. Good morning. Uh, thank you so, so much, uh, Council President Hucker, and to our council members of the Planning, Housing, and Economic Development Committee, uh, Chairman Reamer, and then to Councilmember Jawando and Commissioner uh, Councilmember Friesen, uh, thank you uh, for taking on a number of issues and moving our county forward. Uh, as we are, are stating, certainly uh, April is Fair Housing Month. Uh, this year marks the 53rd anniversary of the Federal Fair Housing Act of 1968. Uh, and you should know also the 54th anniversary of the open housing law in Montgomery County. We actually preceded the federal law. Uh, here in Montgomery County. The Fair Housing Act, as well as our county law safeguards, one of our most basic civil rights. Our law protects everyone who buys or rents uh, a home from discrimination because of their age, race, color, religion, national origin, sex, disability, sexual orientation, source of income, gender identity, uh, marital status, and familiar status. We are pleased, uh, as was mentioned by Councilman Reamer, thank you so much for your support. Uh, we are pleased to have sponsored on last Tuesday a Fair Housing Educational Summit entitled, Where Do You Live? The title of, of, submitted, uh, of the summit was suggesting that uh, the county has in its home, as you well know, to more than a million people with diverse backgrounds and economic standing. The summit was the result of a five-month research and study of housing issues in the county by the commission. The Human Rights Commission. The Commission planned and executed the summit with a focus on four areas. The role of government in systemic housing discrimination, racism in housing discrimination and wealth disparities, overcoming barriers to closing the minority home ownership gap, and lastly, the history of housing discrimination in Montgomery County. We have followed to all of you a copy of each of those summit sessions I uh, hope you get a chance to review those, and we invite the community to go to the Office of Human Rights website to also view the sessions if they were not able to attend. While we are all different and may have diverse backgrounds and economic standing, we all share the need for shelter and a safe place to call home. Fair housing is about equal access, as was already mentioned by, uh, by Councilmember Jawando, to good jobs safe neighborhoods, good schools, and reliable transportation. In Montgomery County, while we believe we have one of the most progressive housing laws in the country, the summit revealed it was not always that way. And to be sure the progress has been made, we still, as you all have noted, got still more work to do. I want to thank Montgomery County Human Rights Commission, the Interagency Fair Housing Coordinating Group, and of course our staff who helped enforce the county's fair housing law. Folks, everyone has an important role to continue to, us, to move us forward. Together, we can ensure that residents have an equal right and access to a home of their choosing and level of affordability. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Ms. Britta. I think you're muted. On behalf of GCAR and its over 12,000 members, thank you to Council President Hucker, PHED Committee Chair Reamer, and the rest of the PHED Committee for this proclamation. Fair housing is an integral part of our jobs as realtors, and we pledge as part of our code of ethics to ensure equal service to all. In addition to fair housing being a big part of a realtor's professional training and education, GCAR has taken steps over the last year to plan and provide programming for our members to learn about the deep and fraught history of fair housing in the country, including the impact redlining and other unjust laws have had in our region. As we did recently in a letter of support to the council, I'd like to congratulate council member Katz, 
Council Member Glass and the entire council for their efforts to ban the box in rental housing. Realtors embrace a higher standard of practice than even the Fair Housing Act requires, and we will strive to further our efforts to ensure all who seek the American dream of homeownership have that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Vitale. Good morning, and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak today for making this proclamation, and most importantly, for all the work that everyone here has done to forward the right to fair housing. Legal Aid, Maryland Legal Aid, provides free civil legal assistance to individuals and families who are low income. And last year alone, we served uh, almost 9,000 Montgomery County residents, many of whom were assisted with housing-related issues. For our clients, as for everybody, housing means more than just four walls and a roof. It means safety, security, and a home for you and your family. And it's not just a civil right, it's a human right. The right to adequate housing was first recognized as part of the right to an adequate standard of living in 1948, uh, Article 25 of the Uni Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it was further defined and expanded upon by other human, inter human I'm sorry, international human rights treaties and instruments over the years. The passage of the Fair Housing Act was a major step in preserving and promoting the human right to secure and adequate housing in the United States by barring housing discrimination based on race, color, religion, national origin, sex, disability, or family status. Uh, additional laws passed at the federal and state and local levels have expanded and um, continue to protect those rights. Um, that said, while the FHA was, as Council President Hucker said, a crucial milestone in the protection, uh, the protection of the right to housing, discrimination in housing continues to be a problem across the country, across the world, and even here in Maryland. Uh, leading to families being forced into substandard housing, uh, facing lack of security of tenure in housing, and in some instances facing homelessness. Addressing these issues requires more than federal laws or international human rights instruments. It requires local leadership and local involvement. Uh, and I again want to extend my thanks to the county executive, to all the members of the council, and to all of the county agencies and employees who work hard every day to protect the rights of Montgomery County residents. Um, together, all of us here, uh, the county government and everybody else on this call, and every one of our neighbors and friends, uh, we can work together to make sure that we're promoting the right to fair housing and ensuring that nobody is left in the cold. Thank you, Frank. Uh, that was terrific. Uh, thank you to all of you for your comments. Uh, now, colleagues, if we could uh, turn to the proclamation. Uh, I'll begin, then we can just take turns. Proclamation of Montgomery County Council. Whereas Fair Housing Month recognizes the significance of the Fair Housing Act, which sets forth a national policy of fair housing and prohibits discrimination based on race, color, religion, sexual orientation, national origin, or disability, and Chairman Raymond. Whereas Montgomery County, Maryland, additionally prohibits discrimination in the sale or rental of housing based on marital status, physical or mental disability, ancestry, presence of children, source of income, age and family responsibilities and Councilmember whereas we recognize home seekers still face inequities such as unfair pricing steering and redlining which exclude them from residing in the communities and neighborhoods of their choosing and you're muted whereas we recommit to fighting all discriminatory housing practices that illegally use any discriminatory factor as a basis to determine the availability or selection of real estate and. Whereas we hereby reaffirm that all individuals in Montgomery County, Maryland have every right to fair housing and the availability of equal housing terms. Now therefore be it resolved by the, that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland hereby recognizes the month of April 21, 2021 as Fair Housing Month presented on the 27th day of April signed by all four of us. Thank you all for all your work to guarantee fair housing to all of our residents. We'll see you all soon. Keep up the good work. All right, colleagues, uh, thank you for joining us. Now we'll have general business. Madam Clerk, could you please share the announcements, agenda changes, or petitions? Good morning, Mr. President and Council Members. 
So we do have an addendum under general business point five A, the public hearing on additional amendments to the recommended FY22 capital budget and FY21 to 26 CIP and additional amendments to the recommended FY22 operating budget is scheduled for Friday, May 14th at 1.30 p.m. On the consent calendar for D, deleted introduction, amendment to the FY21 to 26 CIP, MNCI PPC, Powerline Trail, deleted for E, introduction, amendment to the FY21 to 26 CIP, Department of Transportation, Bus Rapid Transit, Beers Mill Road, deleted for F, introduction, amendment to the FY21 to 26 to the CIP, Department of Transportation, Bus Rapid Transit System Development, deleted G, 4G, introduction, amendments to the FY21 to 26 CIP, Department of Transportation, Bus Priority Lanes. Postponed, item six, Work session on the Ashton Village Center section sector plan. That is all, Mr. President. Terrific. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, since there are no minutes for approval today, we can now sit as the Board of Health. Dr. Gales, Dr. Stoddard, are we ready to begin? Good morning. I am. Good morning. Everybody, Dr. welcome. All right, Dr. Gales, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Uh, before we start the formal presentation, I did want to give a couple of updates uh, on two items I think of, of, are of importance and likely to be in, in the question period. The first one is we do not have any updated guidance on the uh, distribution of Johnson & Johnson doses to us um, as, as local health departments departments coming from the feds to the state to the local health departments. Uh, when we do find that out, we will let you all know. Um, in addition to that, there have not been any uh, changes to the, the guidelines uh, provided from the state in terms of how those doses should be used. So as it currently stands, we will continue to, uh, we will restart, I continue, we will restart using the Johnson & Johnson doses uh, once they are provided. We did have a supply of doses uh, remaining when there was a pause that we're continuing to use, particularly with our homebound uh, population, given the ease of getting one shot versus two shots from a logistical perspective. Uh, and again, as I said, we do not have any updated allocations in terms of uh, what doses we will receive from the state and how those doses will be distributed and doled out. The second component it relates to mass guidance. Uh, there is conversation and chatter that there will be an announcement by the Biden administration and the CDC today in terms of providing new face covering guidelines, uh, particularly for those who are vaccinated uh, in, uh, and, and new policies related to elder usage. We do not have any updates on that so far. That has not been announced. Uh, and from the public health perspective, the guidance that we would provide will continue to be consistent with the CDC and any further guidance that the state would provide. So those are two important announcements, again, that I anticipate questions may be coming about those two particular things, but just wanted to uh, preempt that and give you the updates that we have so far. Uh, let me attempt to share my screen. Uh, it's not working. One second. All right, let's see if this works. All right, so I wanted to provide an update in terms of where we stand with our uh, vaccine numbers and community transmission levels. Uh, in terms of community transmission, our test positivity rate continues to be, uh, I think it was 24th yesterday out of the state. Uh, and our case rate is, I believe, 21st out of 24 jurisdictions. Uh, and our cases have dropped now, averaging under 100 cases on a daily basis. Our hospitalization numbers are holding steady. And um, as of yesterday, we had uh, reached the mark of 50.4% of our residents having received at least one dose of the vaccine. 
Now, just to, again, get further a uh, picture of where we stand in terms of our transmission risk, uh, our transmission rate has, uh, has dropped to 8.3 cases per 100,000 residents. Uh, it had been over the 10 per 100,000 resident threshold uh, for the last several weeks. It has dropped and hopefully will continue to move downward in that direction. And that's consistent with CDC definition of moderate risk of transmission. Uh, in terms of looking at our doses uh, of our percentage of our residents vaccinated, again, yesterday we crossed the 50% uh, threshold or milestone of our 50% of our residents receiving at least one dose. And we currently stand at 34% of our residents being vaccinated. And when you look at that, again, in comparison to other jurisdictions, we are just behind Howard and Talbot County. Uh, and when looking at our percentages of our older populations, we've, uh, received, we've crossed 70% of those 65 and up uh, who've been fully vaccinated. Uh, next slide here just shows the number of vaccines that we have administered uh, throughout the, the vaccine response so far. Uh, and this breaks down the site of uh, where uh, folks have received that. And as you can see, the percentage, the two places where the majority of our residents are receiving vaccines are the county operation apparatus and the mass vac sites, uh, not only the one here in Germantown, but across the state. Uh, this breaks down the age distribution, again, in terms of uh, the percentage, excuse me, of folks who are coming in and getting vaccinated. We are hopeful that the percentage of younger people will continue to increase as some jurisdictions have experienced some hesitancy in younger populations. Uh, and we think that could be what is driving uh, the phenomenon in a few jurisdictions where the, the, the supply of vaccine is out performing the demand of the vaccine. And so it underscores uh, the importance of providing further education and outreach to those respective communities to ensure that they're getting vaccine coverage. And as you know, some states have taken some different actions. Uh, yesterday, the governor of West Virginia announced that the state would be providing $100 savings bonds to those uh, between 16 and 35, I believe, to encourage them to get vaccinated. Uh, this breaks down our race, uh, vaccine rates by race and ethnic categories. Again, we have seen a significant drop in the percentage difference, the gap between white residents and black residents and Latino residents um, over time. Uh, and we're hopeful that particularly as it has been opened up to uh, across age categories, that we'll see those gaps close even more, but also underscores the need to continue to uh, provide some focused uh, interventions uh, and outreach to those areas that have been hit hardest by geography and racial and ethnic categories. This shows you the geographic breakdown once again in terms of uh, the percentage of folks who received at least one dose over the uh, 65 and up. And if you think back to the graph three slides, three or four slides ago, uh, the percentage of 65 and up who have received at least one dose is well over 80%. Uh, and this just underscores that we have a ways to go with those under 65, given that it is now open across all different age categories. Uh, and this, this is just another geographic representation of the percentage of folks who received at least one dose with an overlaying component to show the percentage of those who uh, uh, a higher percentage of those who've been fully vaccinated. Uh, we don't currently have, again, we are at 36%, 34% of our residents who've been fully vaccinated. So we do have a ways to go before we reach the 50% threshold, which was included as a part of the reopening metrics that will be debated, uh, or at least have, have been introduced and will be discussed later. Uh, Pre-registration statistics, we still have roughly over 100,000 folks who are in our pre-registration queue who uh, are awaiting vaccine appointments. Uh, and again, it's not clear. We'd have to clean the data further to tease out how many of those may have received vaccines in other sites. Uh, but unlike uh, a lot of the other jurisdictions right now, we still have a higher demand than the supply that we have available. Uh, and so we're going to continue to work as best as we can through an appointment system, but we are working on contingency plans behind the scenes to be able to stand up, walk up options in the future. 
Uh, we continue to use our equity framework. And again, that is going to take on even more importance as we have um, opened up or all folks across the age categories are eligible for the vaccine. Again, there hasn't been significant change in terms of those tier one zip codes based upon the equity criteria and the impact of COVID in terms of transmission levels, uh, related morbidity, uh, COVID related morbidity, um, as well as number of new cases. That concludes the presentation part. I'm um, happy to answer any questions. I would throw out two other things just as I thought through in the presentation. Uh, of note also, uh, we are hopeful that there will be a hearing uh, by FDA to consider uh, dropping the age, the lower age limit for at least one of the vaccines. Uh, Pfizer has requested an EUA hearing to permit the use of their vaccine in uh, pediatric populations between 12 and 15. They continue to do trials in terms of the efficacy and safety of using the vaccine in younger populations. Uh, don't believe there has been a date uh, assigned to that. We speculate that that may have been temporarily postponed due to working through the issues with the Johnson & Johnson dose uh, from the last several weeks. Uh, and the other one that I wanted to highlight is one, one area that we talk a lot about is our homebound population. We had over 1,300 who had been pre-registered. We vaccinated uh, over 631, 96 folks have canceled the registration appointments and we have a remaining uh, number in that queue of 627. 165 of those are covered as part of the Aging and Disability Initiative working through independent living facilities, which would leave approximately 462 other individuals who have pre-registered um, saying that they are homebound that we're continuing to work through and chip away uh, in terms of providing vaccines to that group. Uh, I will stop there, turn the floor over to uh, Dr. Stoddard. Happy to answer any questions you all may have. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I have just a few additional points to provide to uh, highlight a few things Dr. Gales provided. We've had a couple of things to it. Uh, first off, the state approached just about an additional mobile vaccination opportunity in our, uh, their words, not mine, hard to reach communities. Uh, and so we actually were approached and they're interested in coming tomorrow through Sunday. So we were approached yesterday about this. We immediately said yes. We're working with them uh, to work out the logistics of those. And we've reached out to the minority health initiatives to help have, have them help us identify appropriate locations. What we've reached out to all of the minority health initiatives. And so the, the it's a mobile opportunity. We're likely to pick uh, several different locations where vaccine will be offered over the next five days. That will not be in lieu of, but in addition to the opportunity they had previously approached us about coming from May 11th to May 17th. And so we will have multiple FEMA FEMA, MEMA coordinated vaccine opportunities coming to Montgomery County uh, starting tomorrow, continuing through Friday, uh, through Sunday, and then an, an additional trip back at least in May. And we've essentially told them anytime they have openings in their schedule, we're more than happy to find places to host uh, FEMA sponsored mobile clinics. They're, they come with the 500 doses, and so the 500 doses are being transferred to us today. Uh, the vaccinators and pre registration is all handled by the FEMA team. Uh, we just have to find locations, provide tables and chairs, and have an on-site liaison to help support those efforts. And we're doing all those things. Uh, Dr. Yellow, I talked about Johnson Johnson. We have approximately 1,300 doses remaining at the mass vaccination site from previous, prior to the pause. Uh, the state um, mass vaccination coordinator did reach out and ask if, if uh, they didn't have numbers yet, but they asked if we were willing to do additional Johnson Johnson doses at the Germantown site. And we, of course, said yes. So we're hoping that will be part of our allocation this week. Um, I know you are getting briefed by Director Riley on the senior center issue. They are working towards uh, opening up senior centers by, you know, by the end of next month is, is the goal. They've got two that they have identified. Obviously, one, one of our senior centers is being utilized as, uh, as, a, as an extension of our homeless sheltering program right now and two are being utilized for vaccination clinics. So we're working through the, through the challenges of that. I don't want to say whether or how those will work out, but they are they are planning to open senior centers. And I also know that the library is one that we're supposed to hear about, but I don't have an initial update this morning. I've reached out to uh, Director Silo uh, and, and uh, have not heard back on an update there. I know that they were still working through some of the details and getting those sites back up and getting their staff back in to do them. So as soon as they have that update, I'll try it. Now, the specific numbers of pre-registration actually got an update this morning, so I'll share that. So there are approximately 111,000 people still in the system. 
77,375 have received a notification, at least one, which leaves a remainder of uh, 33,767 who have still not received their first notification for vaccine opportunity. So just about, uh, you know, uh, we're talking about, a, let's say, 20% off of what we were at last week. And so that gives you a sense of the pacing. We, uh, we at, or at, I think on Sunday was the last day we tracked how many people we added. And we only added about 300 people to the list. So the rate of people for registering is slowing. The rate of people being offered opportunities is staying holding steady. So we are, we are, um, working our way through that list and obviously over the next uh, several weeks we'll complete that list very likely and uh, that's when we'll certainly have to start to consider some of the things we've talked about which are sort of on-demand appointment selection or walk-ups or, or some other opportunities and uh, as I alluded, we are up to, to evolve the vaccine dissemination program to focus more into communities this FEMA effort is a part of that uh, the state has also talked about there's a mobile uh, trailer opportunity that we're working with them to identify uh, uh, to arrange for Montgomery County as well. And so uh, the, the portfolio of vaccination opportunities continues to increase and we're going to continue to support that uh, in partnership with the state and federal government. So that's all I have. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> Let me turn it to my colleagues, but uh, Dr. Gale, since you brought up the homebound residents, um, I'll just say I've been in touch with uh, about half a dozen caretakers for very elderly individuals, most of them in their 90s, who pre-registered, and they're very anxious because they haven't received a timeline or updates from the county, um, is, is what they're telling us. One family in my neighborhood gave up and took three individuals to carry and load their mother in and out of a car to get a vaccine. Um, it's great to hear the update. Uh, are we able to send out an, uh, an email update to those individuals so they at least know where they stand? And will they receive the J&J &J vaccine now that that's available again? Uh, Dr. Bridges is on and can comment further about the specific logistics, but one of the, the issues as we've discussed previously mm -hmm. uh, with it is we have worked to support community clinics to do homebound testing, and we had hoped to be able to leverage our, contact, our contract with one of the agencies who had been working with us to provide testing to homebound folks um, that unfortunately was not able to move forward due to some logistical concerns related to observation of the vaccine distribution. Dr. Bridges, did you have any other? Sure. Good, good morning, Council President Hucker and all. Um, the team began contacting all the individuals that Dr. Gale referenced um, uh, earlier in his uh, update uh, to the Board of Health. Um, they started uh, contacting them via email last night, not only to determine if they still, in fact, um, are requesting a um, vaccine, but to identify any individuals who live in their house because the goal is to not only to vaccinate the resident or homebound resident, but individuals who are in their house as well. So we prepared information to follow up um, beginning last night. We've also added additional uh, clinical staff so that we can aggressively move through the remaining individuals who are homebound to get them vaccinated as quickly as possible. So those clinical, um, those uh, nurses, clinical staff um, that we receive report from our agency, uh, Aging and Disability Services Branch will be trained this week, uh, beginning today, for vaccination protocols so that we can deploy them, similar to the strike teams that we deployed early on in the testing effort where we sent those individuals to nursing homes and assisted living facilities. The team is also identifying those individual spaces that may have already been vaccinated and they're going through and, and um, uh, checking the list to make sure that there are no additional individuals that may have been vaccinated either through our senior independent living um, effort, uh, through assisted living facilities and support of the state or any nursing homes. So that's pretty much the status operationally and logistically for our homebound vaccination um, plan. That's helpful. Thanks. I'm glad an email will go out. Are we able to make a phone call to those individuals too? Because I think a lot of them might not see the email. Yes. Yes. Uh, Council President Harper, we will also follow up with emails, particularly those individual emails that may bounce back, or if we don't hear a response within the next 48 hours, we're going to contact them via um, our pre-registration uh, support line 240-777-2982. Again, 240 777-2982 and any listeners who 
are viewing um, the council sitting as a board of health. If you have pre-registered and you have not received an email uh, by tomorrow, please contact that number. Our call staff are available and we'll follow up to ensure that you receive a vaccination. You anticipated my next question. Okay, great. Thank you all so much for that answer. Councilmember Rice. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so Dr. Gales, um, let me start off with something that we discussed uh, at the end of last week, which is uh, about vaccinations. We continue to hear, and even last night in Up County Citizens Advisory Board meeting, um, we heard from residents there who were on the list to receive vaccinations and still obviously had not uh, received an appointment. Can we can we understand an approximation based on, I know this is difficult, but based on where we are uh, in terms of the list, how many people are still there, how many vaccinations we're still getting, have we run an estimation of how much longer it'll take us to get through that list in terms of an approximation of dates so that people have a fair expectation of when they may start to receive notifications about their eligibility to receive a vaccine? Thank you, Councilman Morales, for the question. Um, your question highlights, again, the challenge that we have at, in our jurisdiction of where the supply doesn't meet the demand. Um, and I think uh, Dr. Stoddard can correct me if I'm wrong with the pre-registration information. We still have over 100,000 folks on that list. And in the last month or so, or the last three weeks in particular, we've had, we went from 10,000 doses a week that we were getting as the health department, as well as the promise of over 3,000 doses a day at the mass vac site. And all of that has been cut. So in terms of math, we went from, for the health department, 10,720 doses to 7,020 doses on a weekly basis. And then for the mass vac site, if you, you put it out for, uh, seven days a week, 3,000 doses a day, that's approximately somewhere between, that's 21,000 doses, when in fact that number has been 4,800 doses for the last several weeks, for the entire week. And so the challenge for us is, is when you look at that, that's, if you put the two of those together alone, that's somewhere in the neighborhood of 12,000 doses a week at our current pace, and we still, you know, again, have approximately 100,000 folks on our pre-registration list. We are hopeful and still have the infrastructure in place to be able to absorb more doses. Uh, in particular, you know, the mass vac site was built to accommodate 3,000 doses a day. And the county infrastructure, in addition to be able to stand up the county sites that we have, we have been banking on getting more doses to be able to provide to our community partners as an additional extension uh, and to communities to provide other sites as well. So the challenge is, and again, a lot of this was informed by the manufacturing issues with Johnson & Johnson, as well as the last two weeks in terms of that those doses being paused. Um, there's speculation that there's somewhere between 10, mil, 10 to 11 million Johnson & Johnson doses waiting to be distributed um, to states across the country to then be distributed to health departments. Uh, and we're hopeful that when that supply increases, that also will take some of the pressure off of the use of the, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, which have been used to make up for the, the shortfall in the Johnson & Johnson doses over the last three weeks. Um, so, unfortunately, I don't have a timeline per se because that would be dependent upon when we get more information information about the doses, but just wanted to level set expectation in terms of the numbers where they stand right now. We're hopeful that will change soon and we will be able to get doses out to those folks um, on the pre-registration list. Uh, and in the meantime, I would encourage folks to not only look at our county sites, but if there are opportunities to get vaccinated through the retail pharmacies or the mass vac sites in other parts of the state, I would encourage folks to continue to uh, look into those resources. Now, uh, 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 yeah, Stoddard, go ahead. I was just going to give some actual numbers to this. So I looked at, I'm looking at the pre-registration data from two weeks ago yesterday. There were 142,500. There were approximately 111,000 people to, uh, as of yesterday. So two weeks, we, we went through about 31,000 people on the list. And, and recognizing that that's not 31,000 people that's been exclusively vaccinated by Montgomery County, that's 31,000 people who we were able to remove via the state list. So that's all sources. And so that tells you just approximation that maybe three, three and a half weeks, we should be able to go through the rest of this list for sure. 
uh, just based on the people who are going to come, come through our opportunities or opportunities around the state. And so I think that gives you a rough estimate of, you know, for the people who are currently on the list, that's really what we're talking about is maybe three, three and a half weeks. Sure. So we're looking at May, June, and then, um, and that's the folks that are on our pre-registration list. And then we need to tackle some of the folks uh, who we haven't hit yet, who may be hesitant to get on the list for whatever reasons. All right. And those can be a myriad of things. I still see our numbers in our communities of color that are woefully short of uh, their white counterparts and just wanted to reiterate that for us. And that's the reason why when it comes to our public vaccination sites that we need to continue to make sure that those are stood up. Uh, and because we have strategies associated um, when it comes to the other sites, uh, it's really uh, first come first serve, who you know, getting the connections, getting vaccine hunters to work for you. Uh, I've seen it, uh, so it does work. Uh, and so I would encourage folks who do uh, and feel really urgent uh, and pressing need about getting an appointment to make sure that they reach out and utilize those services. But I did want to talk about one thing, Dr. Yales, that you mentioned that I think is incredibly important for our communities and especially for the folks who I understand, and I talked about this before last week, are shift workers, our folks who can't, uh, you know, afford the time to get uh, multiple vaccinations, because that means multiple times off of work, sometimes travel, even though it's in Germantown now in Montgomery County for a mass vac site, the reality is, is that that's still far for a lot of people in our community. And so from that perspective, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, certainly represents uh, a much more convenient uh, opportunity for folks. And I will just say this, on March 8th, uh, at the Regency site, I was administered the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. I am perfectly fine. I have not had any health uh, concerns or issues. And so I want to make sure that my community understands that you have a person who's taken it uh, and who is fine. I promise you that I would not advocate for this if I did not feel it was safe, and I would advocate it for any member of my family. So I encourage you to please take whatever vaccine is available to you it is important for us to try and achieve that herd immunity by making sure that as many people as possible avail themselves of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And so, Dr. Gales, what is your message uh, to our community when it comes to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and how important it is for folks to be able to take whichever one is available? Um, because I'm concerned the latest statistics last night in a Washington Post poll uh, said that only 27% of Americans feel comfortable in terms of, you know, taking the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. What do you tell those, uh, you know, 73% uh, who are hesitant or fearful of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine? I would actually take the recording of what you just said and play that uh, because that's, that, that speaks for itself. Um, and you, along with nearly 8 million other folks, have had the same experience. They've taken the vaccine. They've not had the complications that were reported. Uh, and again, it's important to emphasize that there has not been a causal link established to link the vaccine with the episodes of, of the clots in terms of saying folks got this because uh, they got the clots because of the vaccine. Um, and so it's important to, to look at it from that perspective. Well, certainly we acknowledge the concerns and that is why the due diligence was done to look at the different cases. Uh, but you, again, you along with nearly 8 million other folks did not have any of those complications compared to 15, uh, reported cases of, uh, the blood clots. Now, what's also interesting is, is that it created the opportunity to study those cases to find out if that happens, again, extremely, extremely rare. It provided guidance to providers in order to treat that, um, those episodes in a safe manner to minimize any potential long-term risk or side effects. Um, so again, I'm not, not selling a broken record, but your testimony is exactly what I would promote and what I would say to encourage folks to, to get the vaccine. Um, all three vaccines, again, have been uh, nearly 100% effective in terms of preventing COVID-related hospitalizations, as well as 100% effective in terms of preventing COVID-related fatalities. Well, thank you for that. And so certainly, um, as the CDC said, the uh, benefits far outweigh 
uh, any kind of risk uh, that's associated. And we know, again, if we are to get around this corner of the COVID pandemic severely affecting our communities of color, I ask uh, my communities of color, please trust the vaccine. Make sure that you're getting your shot. Avail yourselves of all the different ways in which you can do so, including our vaccine hunters, our county and state uh, programs that are out there. Uh, and we will get through this. So thank you, Dr. Gales. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Stoddard. Mr. President, back to you, sir. Thank you for your questions. Uh, Council Vice President Albernos. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll start with some kudos. Um, last week, uh, towards the end of the week, I had the opportunity to visit the partnership between our vaccine hunters and Holy Cross Hospital at, uh, at a local church in one of the zip codes that has been disproportionately impacted by the virus. And it was remarkable. Uh, and I know that our public health team has very much supported their efforts. And thank you so much for that collaboration and partnerships. I, I almost got emotional um, because there were, it was just remarkable how well organized it was. Uh, and when you think about the backstory, it really is profound the way so many members of our community have stepped up to help uh, in really substantial and authentic ways over this last year. And I know many of my colleagues uh, have supported their efforts as well. And it was just a, a really important moment um, and, and a re really good thing to see. And also represents obviously the next phase in vaccine dissemination as we look at mobile med opportunities, as we look to dive deeper into communities that have been impacted. Um, just another example of the progress that we're making. Uh, and the other kudos I wanna give is to the public health team uh, broadly regarding the public health order we're going to be voting on a little bit later this morning. Uh, this new framework, I think, makes a lot of sense. It, uh, it, it uh, allows um, organizations uh, that have done their best uh, to adhere to the guidelines to have some more definitive goals in place, uh, which I know is something we've been wanting to provide. But now, because um, our community is doing so well with the vaccine rollout, our community is doing so well by adhering to the guidelines, uh, the numbers continue to be where they are, uh, which is a credit to everyone that's worked so hard this last year. So just wanted to start with those two kudos. Um, earlier this week, uh, Dr. Gales, we, we did receive several media inquiries uh, regarding the reports nationally that approximately 8% uh, nationally um, of residents, for whatever reason, are not getting their second vaccination. And Dr. Bridgers did a fantastic job uh, um, under, answering that question as best he could you know, with, with the information that was before him earlier this week. I just wanted to know if you had an opportunity to um, process that a little bit. Um, I know the numbers, fortunately, aren't, aren't as high, maybe even as 8% here locally. And Dr. Bridgers also acknowledged, to his credit and the public health team's credit, the steps we're taking in the event somebody indicates that they can't make the second vaccination, whether it be for work or scheduling challenges, and we quickly accommodate those. But if you could just uh, respond to that, because I know uh, we've re received media inquiries regarding that issue. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Elbernos, for, for that question. Uh, I think it speaks to two, at least in my mind, it speaks to a couple points. I think the first one from a logistical perspective for folks who are still interested in getting their second dose and may have logistical challenges as Dr. Bridges laid out. We will work gladly work with them uh, to make sure to facilitate them getting their second dose. Uh, we're working right now to get additional supply to make sure that we don't have any lapses in that for our residents. Uh, and it's important for folks at home to understand that also, I know folks get really nervous when you know it, it's coming up on their 21st day or their 28th day and they get anxious if they can't make it. Fortunately, there is a window of opportunity and some wiggle room there. So I want to reassure folks at home, if you don't get it exactly on the 21st day or the 28th day, it's still okay. So it, it, you're going to be okay and we will work to facilitate and make sure that you get your appointment and get covered on that. Now, the second component of that on the flip side, though, is there does appear to be some folks who are saying, you know, I got the first one. I'm not going to come in for the second one. I've got, you know, I've got protection. To maximize the protection for your vaccine for the Pfizer and Moderna doses, you need to get both shots. So, for example, receiving the first dose of Pfizer and Moderna, probably two weeks after you get that first dose, you're looking at 50 to 60 percent coverage in terms of protection. 
Now, if you get the second dose, two weeks after the second dose, you're looking at 95 to 96 percent protection. So that's a huge difference in a gap there. And so we know that particularly when looking at breakthrough cases, and when I say breakthrough cases, that's what I'm meaning by that is for folks who have received a dose of the vaccine but have still gone on to con contract COVID. Uh, we know that even with both doses, there's an extremely small chance that you could get it, but look at that window if you've only received one shot. You've still got a 40 to 50 percent chance of contracting COVID because you haven't achieved maximum protection for that vaccine. So for anyone at home who has said, you know, I got the first one, I'm not going to get the second one, or I'm still in that period and thinking I may not get it, don't do that. Come in and get your second shot to maximize your protection. Because not only does that set up and protect you from COVID, it also protects your family members and others who are around you, your family members, your fellow staff members, and your jobs, because you've received maximum protection to prevent potentially spreading it to others in your network. Can I add one thing to that? And I think there's a lot of people who have said, uh, you know, there's a lot of concerns about the second shot and some of the side effects. And I would say that, you, I mean, you hear a lot of, I mean, there are absolutely people who have had uh, sort of uh, feelings of malaise, tiredness, uh, some fever, you know, and had a bad day or two after the second shot, the first shot even for, for, for some people. But it, it is not the majority. Uh, you may, you may, when you read Twitter, you would assume it's everyone. Uh, but the reality is that I'm sure there are some who are participating in this meeting right now have had, I know there are some who have had some, some, uh, you know, some discomfort with the second shot. I know there are people who had no experience of bad feeling at all. And so it all depends on the person and things like that. And so uh, do not, I can almost promise you that your experience with COVID would be worse than you would experience with the second shot of Pfizer, Moderna, or the first shot of Johnson & Johnson, the first and only shot of Johnson & Johnson. And I would also point out, and this is, this is just a broader public health point, 92% is actually a very effective two-dose uh, vaccination effort. So I don't, I don't necessarily agree with the framing of what some of the national media said, 8% being terrible. We have to encourage people to get that second shot. There's no question about it. But 92% is not a, a overly concerning number from a two-dose vaccination effort like we're undertaking right now. We have to get that from 92 to 100. But there are other vaccination efforts that have been far worse than that in terms of the two-dose regiments. So I think it's understanding where we're starting from. We have work to do, but we're not starting from a bad point of getting people to come back for that second shot. So I think it's just, uh, you know, I want to add a little context there too. Well, you guys tag team that perfectly, just as you um, um, suggested Council Member Rice's segment be taped. We should tape that one too. That, that was really good. Um, the final question is um, related to uh, youth, I know we've, we've been discussing this and, and not surprisingly, you know, we were all 18, 20 once, uh, and felt invincible. Um, but I know there's, there's concerted, there, there is a, a strategic effort to make sure that we outreach, uh, to our younger populations to ensure that they receive the vaccination. Um, I guess if, if you could just once again underscore the importance of ensuring in particular our youth who are not immune, uh, and then also related, Dr. Gales, any updates that we've received nationally or from the state on where we are with trials for younger populations, maybe as young as 12, uh, to be able to receive the vaccination in the in the near future. Uh, well, that, that was, yeah, definitely want to underscore. Um, you know, we were all young once, um, and there is this sense of uh, invincibility that comes with youth and young adult status. Um, but what we are seeing is that uh, we are seeing an increase in cases in younger folks, um, in large part, the percentages increase because our older folks are being vaccinated, uh, but we still see cases. We see it in youth, adolescents, young adults and early, I don't, pre-mid, pre-midlife folks. I'll call the 30 to 40 year old folks pre-midlife. I just put myself in the midlife category, I guess, in that. Um, but we are, we, it, it is important for folks to get vaccinated um, because again, it's not only for your safety, it's for the safety of other people again in 
their network. And the higher percentage of folks that we can get vaccinated, the more comfortable and confident, as we will as will be discussed with the, the resolution moving forward in terms of reopening, that we can safely do that and remove some of those restrictions and parameters in place because we know that we would be keeping community transmission down at levels as close to zero as possible. Now, some of the strategies that have gone into that, um, and this has come up before, uh, and I'll mention it here, we have continued to meet and work with our school systems around those, um, looking at op opportunities to, one, provide messaging and outreach to those areas. We met with MCPS earlier this week, actually yesterday, uh, and they are developing and working on strategies to provide outreach to parents and students related to uh, vaccines. As we work behind the scenes to come up with some strategies to be able to offer vaccines to that population once it's approved for younger groups, we basically said, you know, don't wait for that to happen and wait for those logistics to be worked out before that messaging comes. So I know, I know that they will be working on that and sending out information in the near future to address that, um, as well as looking at opportunities to be able to partner uh, to create sites for uh, young people to be able to get the vaccine. We anticipate, uh, for example, the clinical trials for younger people have been ongoing for months now. So that's been happening behind the scenes at a national level. Um, and I know, in fact, that we've had multiple uh, trials here in the, the, the DMV areas. I know people who have been participating in that and some of their children. Uh, and so the data is coming out. It's been in the works for several months. And again, it's encouraging that Pfizer has been able to move forward and put forth a request for a hearing for 12 to 15. While that is also happening, all of the different vaccine candidates are looking at, you know, how to, how to uh, safely provide the vaccine to younger age groups. Um, and so I would encourage folks who have an interest or who have children who are particularly interested in that. One of the key sites here in the DMV area is obviously the National Institutes of Health. That would also be an opportunity for folks to participate in, in terms of uh, being able to, to see if they're eligible and participate in those clinical trials. Thank you very much, Dr. Gales. Um, you know, as somebody who recently learned I can no longer be classified as a young Democrat, uh, I know what you mean in terms of the midlife component. So uh, appreciate your continued leadership. Um, I yield back to you, Mr. Council President. Thank you, Council Vice President. I think we all remember when the young Democrats defined uh, their eligibility upward. Uh, to allow more of us to stay in as long as possible. Um, since you gave the shout out to vaccine hunters, I um, will just mention uh, I toured um, uh, the White Oak Gardens Clinic on Saturday and it was fabulously run by HHS staff and East County Regional Center Director uh, Jay Rubande. Um, over 600 people got vaccinated. Uh, it was a terrific team effort to see Safeway providing the vaccines, the rec department providing the tents, Kingdom Fellowship and Rainbow Community Church there with emergency food relief. Uh, everyday canvassers had already gone door to door to uh, create the line of people uh, waiting to get their vaccine. It was a really beautifully effective partnership uh, once again, uh, using effective messengers. So thanks to everybody who put that together. We just need to uh, continue that. Uh, Council Member Rear. Thank you so much. Great conversation. Appreciate everything. And it, uh, you know, we've already said another context. It's so affirming to be feeling really positive in, in general uh, about where we are and where, where we're going to be soon. So uh, I wanted to start on the second dose issue. I, I really concur with Dr. Stoddard's comment there. I think it's nothing short of miraculous that 92% of the first dose population has come back for the second dose. Um, I was worried that it would be lower, and um, you know, I, I'm, I'm delighted to see how high it is. You know, we'll have to keep this campaign up for a long time to ensure that we can exceed, you know, meet or exceed that level. But um, you know. It's just fantastic to see how many people are taking this seriously and, and, and following through all the way. And, and as the comments have said, I have been concerned that the public comments about, you know, the discomfort with your second dose might lead some to think that it's almost as bad, you know, it, it, that those issues are comparable to getting COVID, you know, and of course they're not, you know, just having the confidence that you have been fully vaccinated will change your life. And whatever discomfort you might experience 
from a second dose, there is actually no health concern about it. It's just a passing discomfort and it takes different forms. But I, my understanding is there's actually no actual health concern about those symptoms. Um, so whatever they might be, you know, it, it's not something that poses a risk to you personally. It's, it's you know, more of a convenience factor. Um, but uh, I think, I believe that most people don't experience them you know, I can say I was worried, you know, I was certainly worried. I thought, what am I going to do? Like, I got to book some time and, and you should book some time. You might as well uh, if you can. But uh, it turned out to be I could just get some rest and it was OK. So, uh, you know, I just think it's important for us to um, try to because there's just been a social media trend, as was said. There's been a social media trend to post about, you know, your symptoms on the on the second shot. And um, uh, I think that's a little concerning. Um, uh, thank you for the work on students. I, I do think that's crucial for us to both campaign with the schools to reach the parents and also provide some direct vaccination clinics or, or administration of doses. Um, in, in general, I think it's amazing how fast this is all shifting. Uh, but um, yesterday I went on to the state website to see how long it would take me to get a, an appointment uh, at, a, at a pharmacy. And Dr. Gales mentioned, you know, we need to start encouraging people more to go to their pharmacies. Uh, yesterday morning, you know, seven in the morning, I was able to get an appointment for 2.30 the same afternoon at a giant. Uh, this morning, I went back on to test it again, make sure that wasn't a fluke. I'm able to get an appointment right now for today, this afternoon, at my local giant. Um, so, the number of doses at the pharmacies, you know, may be stacking up a bit, uh, which is good. You know, that's that's a great sign. But I think we our posture has tended to be and, and maybe our residents think that in general, it's the mass fact sites or it's the county clinics that they should be thinking about for their their appointments. And they should, you know, no, like we want you to pre-register. We want you to if you haven't gotten your shot, come in when we, we send you an invitation. But uh, I don't know the number of doses. If there's a way for us to find out, just to calibrate our own messaging, you know, we don't want to encourage everyone to go to their pharmacy and find out that they can't actually get an appointment uh, soon. But it does seem like there's widespread local availability potentially, and you know, that's the, you know, over the long term, that's that's really an important part of this. So, uh, you know, and then of course, broadly, it makes me feel a lot better about where we're heading in terms of reopening because getting to the point where you, you know, you can get an appointment on demand, you know, pretty much same day or, or next day is an essential ingredient to any additional reopening. And I'm, you know, I'm glad that we're there. So um, I uh, wanted to ask again about the libraries, uh, rec centers, senior centers. Um, regarding libraries, Dr. Starr, at one point you had said that there was no public health directive that was keeping them closed. I'm not sure if I understood what you meant there. Um, could you please expand on on that? And uh, anyway, could you explain what you meant there? Yeah, there was no public health order that said libraries needed to stay closed. In fact, there are some libraries that are open. It's just really more expanding the, the capacity of, of various library of libraries that are not currently open that, that needs to be done. And so my point was, I think you know, the governor's order with the senior centers, for example, senior centers can't effectively open until for the 30th of the month when the governor's order says they can open. So. Um, Right now, there is a public health prohibition around senior centers that they could not physically open be open today. That would be lifted again in several days. And so that was my point about the, about the libraries. As I noted in my uh, testimony, I don't, I don't have any additional updates on the libraries. I'm, I've reached out to Director Vasallo to see you know what the status is. I know they're working through some challenges. I can't really don't know exactly where they are with, with some of those issues with, with uh, staffing particularly and um, that so yeah, can I, I ask, do we know what share of the workforce has been vaccinated? I heard that at Washington Gas, only 50% of the workforce accepted a vaccination appointment, which is very concerning. Um, yeah, we have not been screening our uh, employees to see how many have been vaccinated, uh, largely because we have concerns about the HIPAA implications of your employer going out and looking at your medical records absent your uh, permission to do so. 
uh, what the county attorney is, is looking at that issue and to see whether, you know, what the avenues are, what the reasonable. And, and, and candidly, um, we're not, because we've made offers of opportunities to those people, we're not going to change whether we open or not based on how many choose or don't choose to be vaccinated, okay. so long as they've been offered an opportunity. So that's the bottom line, is is we're assuming that since we've offered you an appointment, you know, that you, with the, that's, with the that's, rare, that's our with obligation. The, with the rare exception that you may have someone who cannot take a vaccine for a medical condition, like we'll, there will be a com reasonable accommodations for those who require them. But so long as we've had the opportunity to offer, that's really what we're focused on. Well, I, I'm just concerned because we learned last week at the Fed committee that housing inspectors are not entering houses or housing units, I should say. You know, libraries aren't reopened. I'm very worried we might not be preparing for an adequate summer camps this summer. We didn't get adequate summer camps last summer. Um, and yet the employees have all been, at, at, you know, invited for appointments. You know, it's time for us to start providing critical public services. There are public health and other imperatives, you know, at, at play here as well. Um, so, you know, I, I hope that the executive branch can can work through that, uh, you know, expeditiously. We were we were sort of all expecting a library's announcement a few weeks ago, and it's you know hasn't come yet. But um, in, in any event. Uh, Thank you to, to your work. I don't know, Dr. Gales, if you wanted to add anything uh, that might have come to mind, but um, you know, thank you for your recommendations and thank you for this new order. You know, we'll we'll talk about this new order soon, but I, I'm really grateful for uh, what I think is a kind of a paradigm shift here. We've gotten to the point where you know we are we're seeing the demonstrable success of our vaccination campaign. You know, cases plateaued, and then now they're on a downward trend. And that's really, you know, comforting. Um, and, you know, we're, we're seeing, we're making progress. So thank you. I would just say thank you, Council Member Rimmer, for sharing your experience with the vaccine as well. And I think it's important. One, I'm glad you had a positive experience with it. Um, and what you stated is right. We are still learning long-term effects of having a COVID infection. And so when looking at, you know, apples to apples, uh, the side effects have been temporary uh, in terms of the vaccine. And I also wanted to throw out to, uh, to Council Member Rice's point about getting the Johnson & Johnson dose. I don't think I'm breaking HIPAA within this since the county executive talked about receiving the vaccine. He too also received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and has not had any of the complications that have been mentioned. The best vaccine is whichever one you can get. And, uh, you know, Absolutely. And I thank Council Member Rice for his important comments there. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, Cam um, Council President. And thank you for all sharing. Anybody that uh, has ever seen Council Member Rice jump rope should take the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. I, I might take it. I don't even need it at this point. Take it to see if I can jump rope that way. But anyhow, um, my question, first off, I think we do need to be clear on the 50.4% uh, uh, of the residents who have gotten the vaccine. That's eligible residents. That's not somebody that is just their, their general population. Is that correct? So it would be 50. That's, everybody. That's the whole population, 50.4% of our whole population. It's so over 60% of our eligible. Yeah. So is that counting somebody that's 10 years old in their population? Yes, because I think the point is that, um, as we've talked about earlier in this meeting, eligibility is going to shift as we move forward. Right. And we didn't want to go forward, then go backwards and forwards and backwards because you add new eligible people, then your percentage drops if you just use the eligible population. We thought, and candidly, the virus can seemingly infect every person. Right. And so, obviously, uh, from a from a herd immunity or, or whatever protective immunity perspective we're looking at, it's a whole population number anyway. So if we need to get 78%, we might as well just express it as such on our dashboard, which is what we've done. And so it is inclusive of everybody on the dashboard. Well, then that actually, can, and I understand what you're saying, and I appreciate what you're saying, but that actually is better than, I mean, it, it, we're saying that the percentage of people that could take this vaccine, whatever, whether it be Johnson & Johnson or the other two, that who could take it, their percentages are very good on, on the availability. So that's great. Um, I thought it was strictly for the eligible. And for the idea for Pfizer, that I think you said, Dr. Gales, that that, um, that it would be for 12 and up. Um, if we were 
and I know that we have now started to get some Pfizer, but there was some freezer issues, I think, in the very beginning. Is is that still a problem to get freezers for the Pfizer? Thank you for the question there. Actually, one of the things that evolved over time was there were some new guidelines that were offered in terms of freezer storage that didn't require them to deep freeze storage for Pfizer that it did originally. So we've been able to utilize the storage space that we have. Uh, and as point of reference, we've been receiving Pfizer for the last at least the last month or so, and we've not had any issues with storage, uh, both in terms of being able to store it on site as well as transport it and store it at the different venues. Uh, and fortunately, uh, the community partners who have also utilized Pfizer doses have not had any challenges as well. Great, that's good. And and there again, I I um, received you know my second shot, and it was Moderna. And yes, my arm hurt for a day. And I, I can tell you, I'll put up with my arm hurting a day rather than have to go to a hospital for many days. So it, it's it's just illogical not to put yourself through that. And I understand everybody says, well, you know, that, that you really could be go through these problems. I'm assuming that for a regular flu shot out of the millions that are given that somebody has had issues you know, eight eight people, ten people, whatever, have had issues over the years with a regular flu shot. But of course, this is so newsworthy that, and then of course, the newsworthiness scares people off. It, it it's just illogical to me, and I and I encourage everyone to take it. And then the the last thing I was going to say, well, two things. First off, when you're talking about the various places for the for the uh, to receive the vaccine, I know that that you all and HHS and everybody else has worked very hard to make certain that that churches and other religious organizations have found partners in order to to have a, a clinics in in the uh, in that in those facilities. Are you counting that as well? Is are those? I mean, for instance, if CVS is a partner with, you know, a church in in Rockville, it, are you counting those in the numbers that we're receiving as well? How, how does that fit in? It's being counted in terms of the the total population vaccinated. So the way we look at it is, regardless of the source of where you got it. The, the zip code where you live is pulled when we look at the number of people vaccinated. So when we say 50.4% of our population has received the first dose of the vaccine, that is including anyone from Montgomery County who's a resident who's been vaccinated at any of the different sites across the state. Now, I, and I appreciate that answer, but what I was trying to ask was when the with the with the answer for the hundred thousand people or whatever that are still looking to receive it and how fast they can get it, it, it are you counting in the numbers that you're saying can be provided by the this county um in the state are those num or are, are that you know what I'm asking now yeah so the short answer is no. Uh, so in terms of like plot, plotting out how many how long it would take for us to get there. We only really have a firm handle in terms of how many doses we have available with the health department and uh, the mass vac site. But yes, you're right. Uh, there is a pocket of other doses there that are available. And what we try to do is in the process of sending out links to folks, uh, we do recognize, you know, we'll send multiple, you know, send a link to a person multiple times and they'll just not respond and then we'll clean. We'll clean their name off the list, anticipating that either they most likely received a dose somewhere else, or if someone were to report to us that they've received a dose, we try to take their name from that list. Or in some cases, they're able to go through and remove their uh, their name from the pre-registration link. And I had someone say that they had gone to, uh, I think it was a, a, gro a grocery store or a, a drug store, and received their first shot not in Montgomery County. They live in Montgomery County, but went someplace else to get it because they wanted it, which is the right thing to do. But can they get their second shot in Montgomery County from another source, or do they have to go back to the same place that they got their first one? 
We can help facilitate getting it locally. Uh, part of the challenge is, is that the dose allocations are based upon where the first doses were done. Uh, so we're, you know, we're working around that. But if there are, you know, significant logistical issues that prevent the person from being able to do that, they should contact uh, C-19 vaccines. I'm sorry, C-19 vaccination at MontgomeryCountyMD.gov to help uh, schedule a time and the team will help facilitate that opportunity. Okay, thank you. And last one, on the idea of to, to make to help their young people uh, get the vaccine, which they should be doing if they're if they're eligible to get it. I, I wonder if we could work with their with their partners from uh, MCPS and say that somebody that is going to be on a team that wants to to be on uh, you know the various teams in, in Montgomery County Public Schools that that would be a requirement for them to. To, uh, to, be, to be able to be on the team is that they would get vaccination. I don't know whether that's possible or sensible or whatever, but I think that's something that might we might want to explore. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Friedson. Thank you, this has been a really great conversation. Uh, one of the better ones we've had uh, based uh, partially on the fact that we have better news. Uh, than, than we've had, which is uh, really uh, reassuring. I, I will say I learned a lot, including the fact that I fall into the official pre-midlife category. <laughs> so I appreciate that. I'm moving towards catching up to my uh, colleagues, uh, not quite as well uh, as they have. Um, I really appreciate the conversation as well about the Twitter whataboutism, uh, you know, the uh, both with the side effects and the focus being on the negative and not on the positive. Uh, the fact that uh, you have uh, temporary, uh, fairly mild side effects uh, for a life-saving vaccine that we've been desperately waiting for. Uh, the fact that 8% is relatively low uh, for, for second doses. Uh, and, uh, you know, with, with everything that happens, it seems that the uh, immediate uh, Twitter response is a very negative one. And unfortunately, uh, those who are uh, watching see the negative. And so I think we have to do what we can uh, to drown that out as best as we can, because there is a tremendous amount of positive news. We pushed for a mass vaccination site in Montgomery County. We now have one. We have pushed for more doses. Uh, it looks like more are now coming with Johnson & Johnson uh, coming back uh, online. If you had asked uh, many of us uh, when we would get to 50% of the total population in Montgomery County, uh, receiving a first dose, uh, I would not have anticipated that would be before May. And in all of our conversations uh, prior to now, uh, we have uh, moved forward ahead of schedule. Uh, and I understand it's been frustrating and it's been challenging, and this has been uh, a really difficult time for so many of our families. Uh, but uh, we are moving forward in pretty significant and, and positive uh, way. I'd also point out uh, and, and credit to the public health team, Dr. Gales, Dr. Stoddard, Dr. Bridgers, and uh, everybody who's been working so hard, not just to get the vaccine doses out, but with your guidance. And we were at 50 cases per 100,000 in extremely dangerous category, risk of the entire public or the entire health system, the healthcare system, uh, not being able to uh, handle uh, where we were only three months ago, back in late January, when we were at uh, that rate, we're now well below 10 and actually, uh, you know, currently for the last few days below nine uh, in the in the eight uh, per uh, 100,000. That is significant, well below 3% test positivity rate and consistently there uh, and, and, and below uh, where, uh, you know, regional counterparts and, uh, and, and other jurisdictions for the most part around the state. So I just wanted to take a moment to note the fact as, as many of us have, that uh, it has not been easy. It, it has been really uh, frustrating and challenging. Nothing about this has been perfect, neither our response uh, nor the uh, ability to respond to the crisis in any way, but uh, we are uh, in uh, much better shape than many of us uh, could have imagined, and we have to keep that going. And so I just uh, really wanted to push that and note that I will echo comments made by colleagues. We've also been pushing for uh, a light uh, at the end of the tunnel for residents to incentivize the behavior that we want, including getting vaccinations and in following public health guidelines. And we now have an order based on specific metrics that are transparent and accountable and can be easily followed uh, by residents, which we've been advocating for and are now in a place uh, to do it. So 
I just really appreciate all the work that has gone into getting us here. I know there have been a lot of sleepless nights. Uh, there's no such thing as weekends uh, anymore. Uh, and uh, you know, someone asked me, sorry about a Sunday, and I asked what a Sunday was, and uh, the public health team has just been uh, at the forefront of this, and I just wanted to make sure that we talked about uh, all the positives, because usually these conversations have been about all the things that aren't working, and I think that today we finally have turned the corner where we're mostly focused on all the things that actually are working. And that is a notable moment, and that will be reflected in the uh, public health regulation that we take up shortly and i just thought that, that needed to be uh, reiterated as many colleagues have shared uh, earlier and i also want to point out in addition to the public health team we have to thank our residents the businesses and organizations and families who have made unthinkable sacrifices have totally changed their behavior have made incalculable uh, changes to their lives and livelihoods in order to keep themselves their families and our neighbors safe and uh, it's working and we have to keep moving forward on it. Uh, I did just have a couple specific questions. Many of my uh, questions were already asked. I just wanted to get clarification on the Johnson & Johnson doses. Uh, we, ha we had 1,300 doses that were held uh, based on the state order following the CDC uh, review out of an abundance of caution. Is that the number that I heard earlier? I think Dr. Stoddard had mentioned that. But here at the mass vaccination site, there are several hundred at, at the local uh, Department of Health. I think Dr. Yales has that number. There are 1,300 for the mass vaccination site at Holy Cross, uh, Germantown, that can be used at the mass vac site. There are some number of hundreds that are left at the public health that will be used for our homebound residents and uh, other groups that are targeted with those. Yes, we have, I believe, 284 doses yesterday uh, on site at Dennis Avenue. Great. Okay. So based on where we currently are, we don't know how many new Johnson & Johnson doses we're going to get of the millions that are being shipped out. We're waiting to hear. We've told the state, you know, we're ready. Send, send them to us as quickly as you can. We'll administer them as fast uh, as we uh, receive them and can get uh, 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 folks uh, for their appointments. Uh, and we're allowed to, based on the current guidance, you are able to administer the ones that we have currently that were held, held over now or we're waiting for the state on that. Uh, we're allowed to administer now. There currently aren't any restrictions on uh, distribution of those or any contraindications. Um, so we will continue to use those. Um, we've been prioritizing those to get through that homebound list that we talked about earlier. Now, if the state does release any um, specific guidelines to change that, we will obviously implement those. But at this current time, there aren't any restrictions on usage. Terrific. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. That's what I thought, but I wanted to make sure I understood that. Uh, that's good news. I hope that we do get more. I will note, as has been stated, uh, the place where there's a large backup is the local health department in Montgomery County, uh, where we have folks who want to receive access who haven't been able to. And so hopefully, as additional doses uh, are uh, received by the state, that a, a large share of them come to Montgomery County so that we can get shots in arms uh, as quickly as possible. Um, I, I will note that 8% and, and, and folks that aren't re returning, as things get closer uh, to folks, it will be better because some of it, in the, uh, the hesitancy is based on practicality, not philosophy. And so if you are a parent who has to look after children during the day, if you are a worker who can't afford to take off of work for a day or uh, two days, certainly can't go a long distance uh, to do it. So as we make it easier, I think that the uh, the, the percentage of those who uh, may not show up for a second dose will diminish as well because it will be more convenient and less of a disruption in people's lives uh, in order to get the first and the second dose. So hopefully uh, that will help uh, as well. If it's possible at some point, if we have our own either Montgomery County or state number for the 8%, is that something that can be shared? The 8% is a national number. Uh, but if, if it's possible uh, at, at some point, I'm sure it's something that the, the state health department and the county health department are keeping an eye on and monitoring. But if that's something that could be shared, um, you know, that would be helpful. My my guess, and I don't know, you know I'm certainly not an expert, is that our number is going to be lower um, based on the level of demand that we have uh, in the county. And so uh, that will be positive news as well. But it's obviously become a major topic of conversation in the public. So I, hopefully we could dispel some of that. Um, okay, um, 
in terms of, there was a conversation before about the total population. That's what we're basing this order off of. I understand the rationale uh, b behind that uh, with eligibility changing and the fact that uh, even though our progress should be judged by percentage eligible, the virus is not uh, making determinations based on eligibility. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, 15 versus 16 is not something that uh, a virus is uh, determining, just like it doesn't respect borders. Um, but do we have a percentage of um, how much of the population is not eligible? You know, is it 21 percent, 22 percent, 23 percent? Do we know that that number? Population, we know that 17 and younger is about 18 percent. So obviously, if you take the 17 year olds out of that who are eligible, it's probably in the area of maybe you know 17, 16 or 17 percent. Is my guess? Is our best estimate? Okay, that would be helpful. So, so 100% in terms of the total population uh, receiving a first dose is really 77% based on, uh, you know, based on, we can't get above 77% based on the eligibility today, right? We're at 50%, but we can't get to 100% because 17% of the population is not even able to get a vaccine. For the other 80, 83 you know, could. Yeah, so I, think we, I mean, if we got everyone vaccinated, we get 80, we get up to 80, 83 percent of everyone. Okay. Well, I think that we should note that. I think there's a lot of confusion around uh, what this means. There is the <clears throat> the vaccination dashboard, which I think is terrific, particularly as we introduce this new portal. I think making that very clear of the percentage of the you know p p population you know uh, that that isn't eligible. Um, there's also uh, two major charts uh, on that uh, website. The first one is the 50.4% that we just hit yesterday uh, for uh, those who received uh, at least a first dose. And then uh, the, the second one to that to the right is the 33.6 that have been fully vaccinated. Based on that chart, is that fully vaccinated as in two weeks following a shot or is that fully vaccinated as in received a first dose of Johnson & Johnson or the second of a two dose vaccine? The chart is just both doses. So it really needs to be framed as both doses as opposed to fully vaccinated because as you noted, fully vaccinated does include the two week period post second dose or post Johnson and Johnson at which point you're fully immune. So um, we can clarify that element on the page because you're correct in, in our met, in, in CDC's definition of fully vaccinated, you do deem that need that post second dose uh, time to develop the immunity. Okay, so I, I, by the time, like by the end of the day today, that really the language really needs to be changed on that dashboard so folks can follow based on the order. And so I'd hope that we can get uh, that clarified. And just so folks understand, for the first two phases of the order, the the dashboard, the total percentage population is is the number. We're at fifty percent now. That will be triggered when we hit sixty. When that hits sixty percent, the second phase will be triggered. For the third phase of total uh, uh, population fully vaccinated, the chart on the right that we currently have, when that hits 50, two weeks following the day that that hits 50 is when it will go into effect. Is that accurate? Based on the right. order, that, that is public health regulation. Yes. Okay, great. So if you could, if we could get that uh, cleaned up and uh, the language clarified, that would be uh, great. Uh, I will just. Uh, and where I started, uh, besides my pre-midlife uh, 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 recognition, uh, and just thank you for all the hard work. I, I really do feel much better about the place that we're at as a county, and uh, it's a credit to the public health team and to our residents, businesses, and organizations who have stepped up to follow guidance and are following through with what we're asking them to do, including getting vaccinated and large numbers and appreciate all, all of the efforts to get here. Thanks. Thank you. Council Member Glass. Thank you very much, Mr. President. A very good conversation this morning. I appreciate all of the updates and, and most of the questions that I had asked uh, or were planning on asked had been had been asked by my colleagues. So, so I'll keep this uh, pretty short. Uh, um, the only question I have is is regarding our facilities, and this has come up by by a few of my colleagues. Um, you know, I, I think it's important for us to share.
share with our residents some of the complexities with opening up facilities that uh, are serving double duty as uh, testing and vaccination sites and some other things. And so, um, you know, Dr. Gales and Stoddard, if if um, and Dr. Bridges, of course, uh, if if you can go a, a little more um, in and explain um, kind of the the internal deliberations that are taking place uh, about uh, where to expand uh, services, uh, whether they are senior services, recreation services, that sort of thing, uh, and, and uh, justify that or compare that to uh, the, the health needs that we're trying to serve as well. Thank you, Councilmember Glass, for the question. Uh, Dr. Bridgers has been our representative in a number of those conversations with the senior centers, which also influences our rec centers. Um, so I would uh, open the floor to him. He can give a brief summary about some of those conversations and insights. Thank you. Sure, thank you, Councilmember Glass. So we've had conversations with our senior citizens, uh, access, um, availability, time, space, and I'm just trying to draw from recall here is I don't have my notes in front of me, but we have daily planning conversations with our aging and disability services to look at some of those facilities. Um, just uh, just, uh, just a, a quick note. And that's pretty much, um, I can provide you with a written summary. Uh, I just don't have the information before me. No, I, I, I appreciate that. And and even just um, more generally. Dr. Riley said something this, and I think it's a really important thing for us to remind all of that. And I know you know all this, but we have, we have recreation buildings and staff working in vaccination testing. We've expanded into two recreation centers, our homeless population, to spread them out so they're not as compressed and, and you know, at risk for a, transmission they're working those the recreation staff are working those library staff as well uh, and so i know that i think uh may 8th is the date where we're extricating all of the recreation staff from the hhs testing and vaccination efforts and backfilling those with contract support staff so that those rec staff can begin to do some of those other activities um now th that that's sort of the the staffing piece of it but then as you know you know as we talked about some of those i think uh one of the rec centers is being used for um, two are being used for vaccination sites. One currently is being utilized for that homeless shelter piece. And so obviously, you know, the buildings and the staff are just critically important to the efforts. We realize getting these senior centers and libraries open is critical as well. So we're in the process of shifting all of those people out and getting those buildings cleared, cleaned, and ready to operate as their original intention. But obviously some of that just takes a little bit of time to do, and you don't want to, uh, cause delays in the vaccination testing or other efforts while you're simultaneously planning to open these other things up. And so we're trying to do both those things correctly. Um, and um, I, I promise we're gonna have updates on all these uh, very soon. I'll continue to push those as well. But I think I think your 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 want to illustrate that those 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 staff and buildings have served, been serving those dual roles to help our community is very important. And so just to add a couple of things also come to mind. We also look at um, uh, site uh, con configuration. We have a site survey team. We work with uh, Dr. Stoddard's team to go out and not only look at ease of throughput, but accessibility to make sure that all of those spaces are ADA compliant. We have wheelchair accessible uh, individuals readily available to support those individuals who may have some ambulatory challenges in getting to their sites. We have uh, particular um, um, uh, check-in uh, stations, if you will, so that they don't have to stand in line. There's a, there's a particular space, a desk that they will uh, go to. And we have staff available uh, to them. So we want to make it as easier, as easy as possible and easier for those individuals that may have some mobility challenges. Again, uh, we have staggered them throughout the day. Sometimes we go into facilities and identify spaces where we know that they're early risers or we know that individuals just to not to disrupt their daily schedule and or um, um, personal or family routines and to provide individuals the accessibility to have um, vaccine planning strategies around before, during, and after those spaces. So those are some of the additional things that come to mind. Again, I can provide a more comprehensive narrative as Dr. Stoddard said, but in listening to Dr. Stoddard, a couple of things did come to surface. Uh, and and uh, I really appreciate that explanation as, as my colleagues and I are all getting requests and questions 
from people who've been vaccinated for weeks and some even for months, that they are ready to get outside of their homes. They're ready to socialize. They're ready to to start participating in activities. And, and uh, we're not quite there yet. And the quite frank reason is because we have staff and facilities committed to keeping everybody healthy and trying to get our vaccines out there. And so uh, sharing sharing that insight, I think, is, is important. And we've just had that conversation. So uh, more people will be aware of the complicating factors. Uh, but we're getting there. And Dr. Bridges, thank you for for the preparation uh, and the groundwork that you're doing so that we can all see each other again and seniors and youth can go back to our rec centers uh, and other facilities. So uh, thank you. This is all very encouraging news and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Council Member Juwan. Thank you. Uh, bringing up the rear here and uh, Dr. Gales, you know, I, I still feel young, so I'm just going to say that, you know, I hope I hope we all do. Um, uh, but really happy to that we're here with some good news. Thank you, as always, to all the work that you and your teams, uh, Dr. Bridges, Dr. Stoddard, and everyone that's behind the screen here that's been working furiously. Um, I think this is a testament to the approach we've taken, you know, and I think that, you know, that bears – saying, you know, we're happy that we're moving in the right direction. And I think the reason we've consistently been lower than everyone else in the state, I think you said 24 out of 24 today, uh, uh, counties, Dr. Gales, is because we've taken precautions and we've been uh, methodical. We haven't been able to do everything we want. You know, we still have disparities in the vaccination process. We tried, we've taken steps with our equity framework. We've tried to take others that we were not able to move forward, but we're we're finding workarounds and we're being nimble, uh, but sticking true to, uh, you know, a cautious approach. And that's why we're able to take the action we're going to take uh, in a few minutes here um, and start to reopen and expand capacity. Uh, so it's it's a really a great testament to, I think, collectively, it wasn't always pretty. It wasn't always easy. We didn't always agree, but and we're not out of the woods, but we're making uh, significant progress. So I just wanted to to say that, that the two are connected. I think some people, some people will say after today's action about time, you should have done it five weeks ago. Others will say like, which I think is the correct approach is we'll say, thank you for being methodical. Glad we have 50% of our population vaccinated and glad we're still moving forward. So uh, that's, that's what I think. Uh, and that the data has borne out has happened. So I just want to commend my colleagues, the health department and all of our partners in the community who have helped make this happen. Uh, just a couple of very specific questions because many have been, most have been answered. Just on the variants themselves, uh, do we have any report on has, what's the dominant strain? Do we have any news on that? Have things taken over? Do you still have any concern there? Just how that's, how that's going. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Zawanda. Uh, the, the V117 or the UK strain continues to be the dominant strain in Maryland. Um, and based upon the reports, again, not every strain is getting a uh, sequence to know, but I would suspect that uh, the higher higher percentage of our new cases are the B117 variant consistent with the rest of the state. And it's still, but but thankfully, we didn't know this at first. It seems to be just as, the, the vaccines just seem to be just as effective against it or, or mostly effective. You know, being. So, yeah, so the, the early data suggests the vaccines are uh, effective against uh, particularly the B117, the UK variant, the P variant, uh, the P1 variant or the Brazilian form and the South African form. And in addition to that, to be perfectly candid, I think one thing that has been helpful for us is that, again, we have had tighter restrictions in place to minimize points of contact that would create the type of environment that would allow for the variant strains to flourish and spread more quickly. I appreciate it. Perfect point. Um, I know we've had some, you know, as we continue to go back to school and, you know, uh, Tuesday mornings have become my favorite morning, not just for council session, but it's because the day all of my children are out of the house in school, um, you know, all four of them. And that, that's, it's, it's, uh, has it, it's been a couple weeks. It's still kind of odd. Um, but for those who are still dealing with that, I know we've had some cases. Um, just if you could give an update on how we're doing, uh, 
as we re-enter school and uh, as far as either vaccinations or case rates and, and, and anything you want to add on that point? Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to follow up with you with the more specific you sure. know, with the hard numbers, but we have had uh, some instances of um, of community transmission presenting in terms of staff and students testing positive. Um, we haven't seen as many uh, student to student or staff to student transmission. We have had a couple episodes of that, but it has not been significantly um, significantly higher. Again, I think in large part because we uh, worked hard to get the staff members vaccinated, prevent you know them from bringing it into the classroom. Uh, to potentially transmit to other staff and students. Uh, we have had, we've continued to have some concerns related to youth sports activities. Um, as we, sh we shared with you all last week, we did have a situation where um, we have had a large outbreak of cases related to a hockey tournament um, and hockey teams. So we continue to be concerned about that and in terms of the types of activities that the young people are participating in. But fortunately, we haven't seen a large scale number of outbreaks. There've been smaller cases um, in more isolated situations. And to clarify that, because to your earlier point, I think one would rush and say, well, that's the justification where we should have had, you know, schools in session for a longer period of time. What's very different now than where we were in August of last year, or pretty much through most of the pandemic, is we have vaccines. Yeah, and we have, uh, as with the push to get the teachers and staff for public and non-public schools covered, uh, we've seen that number drop down, and I think in large part due to the vaccine status of the staff and teachers involved. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, and, and the specific data, if I follow up, would be great. Another question I had, and you can speak to it briefly now, is my last question. On the, you know, we're, we're going to, we're implementing a number of strategies to address the disparities in vaccination. Um, we still have those red zones. Uh, you know, uh, there's actually one red zone that's really dark red on the 65 plus in the kind of upper east county. I, I, I would love to know exactly where that is. It was, the, it was really dark red. Uh, in the Upper East County, and that was on the 65 plus, where most of the numbers have been going in the right direction. But still on the 16 to 64, we still have a significant work to do. Are you tracking, uh, you had one slide that showed uh, where people are getting their vaccinations. If they go in the state of Maryland, it's up to, up, updated in the system. We know where they went and they got their vaccination, correct? Is that Yes. Okay. I see you nodding. And I know Dr. Stoddard has talked about this too. If they go out of state, we don't know if they've been vaccinated or not. If they go to DC or Virginia, Northern Virginia, we wouldn't have that access to that, correct? We, we would not, but actually there is a CDC dashboard uh, that uh, we have found that seems to be tracking fully full vaccination, not first dose vaccination, but full vaccination uh, anywhere you receive it. And so we're actually trying to track that because I, I don't want to put forward data that I can't explain. And so we are looking at what the genesis of that dashboard is. But what the dashboard essentially said is, as of yesterday, we were at 37.5 percent population fully vaccinated. And so that means that roughly four percent of our population has been fully vaccinated that we don't know about because they've been vaccinated in other places. But again, that's what this the, it is on the CDC dashboard. I looked at it yesterday, but we have right. to be able to. I want to be able to justify what's on that dashboard with some explainer to tell where it's coming from. But the but the point is we may be farther along than we even realize because there are a fair number of vaccinations occurring outside the state of Maryland for Yeah, that that was gonna be my question. I, I, I know a lot of people I know ten people just that have went to Howard or gone to you know gone to places in DC or that got vaccinated that we probably don't have access to. But it is a knowable number. So I'm glad you're tracking that down because of the process of vaccination. We we should be able to know that. And I, I think in particular to our black and Latino community, um we should know this for everybody, but I would want to know, you know, for going forward, not just for to get where we need to get now, but going forward, where are people accessing the vaccine as a, a kind of an equity framework of where did where are they where did they go and how did they get there so that we can try to track backwards and figure out not only for the ones we still need to get vaccinated, but also just for our our work in public health and in delivery of services going forward, where are people accessing things. And I just think that will be something to, don't expect you to answer it today, but I, I think we should be looking into that for as we go along. 
So, all right. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. I don't see any. Are there any other colleagues that want to chime in? Yeah, I'll text with you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, well, not much to add, obviously. This has been a very robust conversation. I think this is a very important date um, because we are uh, really here uh, acknowledging a very important milestone. Uh, and it is important to recognize that, uh, as, it, as it has been said, we would not be here without the cooperation of our residents and without their full um, understanding of why we had to make certain decisions, uh, listening to what they had to say, but also responding to make sure that we'd ad we would address many of the inequities. So it is a very um, important day, but as we've also said, uh, we still have quite some you know, ways to go. Um, I, in my household, got two uh, daughters in their 20s, and uh, one will get her second shot tomorrow, and the younger one will get her second shot next week, and I'll be there to uh, cheer them on. Um, but it is, as it was also um, stated earlier, you know, it is true that uh, with second shots, people have different reactions to that. And I think the good news is that we know that it has been safe. Uh, in my household, my husband had no symptoms. I had a headache and some joint pain for 48 hours and like clockwork, it was gone. Uh, but the reality is that this is such a critical and important, um, you know, asset for us, this issue of access to vaccinations. It's, it's so critical. And that is what is contributing to what we are going to do next which is something our residents have been wondering for a while. So I am really proud of Montgomery County residents. When we look at what's happening in other jurisdictions, you know, this has not been easy, but this particular milestone has been super, super important. And this team, I think, deserves a lot of credit as it also, I think we need to recognize all of our community partners um, throughout this county that have done such amazing work and continue to do amazing work to get us there. So. You know, congrats, because I think we need to acknowledge that, but also with caution continuing to wear our masks and social distancing when necessary. Um, but most of all, please pre-register and please make sure to get this important vaccine. It is so important and so critical. Um, and I know a lot of folks are also looking forward to the summer. So it's, it's, it's all together, right? It's, it's all part of what we all need to do. Um, but, you know, really important briefing and, uh, again, very important uh, item that we're going to take up next. Um, so just in general, just to say, you know, kudos and, and keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, thanks to all of you for uh, the briefing. Very, very helpful uh, discussion and for all your hard work on the proposed regulation we're about to take up. Uh, colleagues, we can now move on to the formal introduction of the amended Board of Health Regulation. Um, let me try to frame this item a little for anyone following our actions for the first time. On April 20th, the Council acting as the Board of Health added guidance for school graduations following the guidance we had provided for youth sports and for summer camps. And today we're going to consider a broader approach, one that will provide our residents with more predictability and transparency surrounding the reopening process by adding phases for reopening the county based on the percentage of the county population receiving a first COVID-19 vaccination. As our vaccination rates continue to increase and our COVID case rates in Montgomery County decrease, the council is continuing to work closely with our public health team to allow additional activities to resume in a way that's safe for our residents. And we hit a big milestone yesterday. 50% of our residents have received at least one dose of the vaccine and more than 33% are fully vaccinated. And our case rate is much lower than the statewide average, despite the two huge challenges we've always had of being the largest jurisdiction and the most diverse. We are seeing a lot of good news now that so many more vaccines have been made available to us and that has changed everything. After over a year of fighting this virus, this is a significant milestone for our community. The progress validates our approach to take an organized effort to prioritize our seniors, our essential workers, our black and brown communities, particularly those in our hardest hit zip codes. We're all aware that Montgomery County's approach to put public health uh, first and uphold stricter measures than our other jurisdictions 
until more vaccines became available has not always been easy and it's not always been popular with everyone. All of our residents have had to make sacrifices, but these data and how we compare to other jurisdictions now validate our approach and show that we've made the right decisions to prioritize public health over everything else. We've continued to follow the advice of our professional public health team since day one. We owe a huge debt of gratitude toward them and to all their staff and our community partners, as well as all our residents, our small business owners and employees who have made huge sacrifices and contributions to get us to this next phase on the road to recovery now that so many ma more vaccines have become available. That has changed everything. So here's the bottom line. We all wanna reopen as quickly as possible, but we still need to do so safely. This is a process, it's not a light switch. Inevitably, some residents will tell us this approach is too slow and others will tell us it's too relaxed. But today we should acknowledge the significant progress we've made toward reopening safely. And to any residents who wanna see us reopen sooner, please help us to urge your family members, your friends, your neighbors to pre-register with us and to get vaccinated as quickly as possible. The sooner we all get vaccinated, the sooner life will be back to normal. I'll now recognize the council senior legislative attorney, Bob Drummer, to explain the resolution to the public and take any questions. Mr. Drummer. Good morning. Uh, as, as you said, we have before us a fifth amended board of health regulation. The council enacted the first board of health regulation after uh, the governor's loosening of uh, restrictions. Uh, on March 12th, the first amended uh, regulation was on March 19th, and that dealt with guidance on sports. The second amended regulation dealt with spectators at sports on March 26th. The third dealt with guidance for summer camps on April 13th. And the fourth dealt with school graduation ceremonies on April 20th. Today, we have, as the council president stated, a fifth amended regulation that would set uh, the reopening based on the percentage of the total population of the county that receives vaccinations. The first two stages, and it sounds like listening this morning, we've hit stage one, is it 50% of the population receiving at least one dose of a COVID vaccine? Uh, we would increase the gathering limits from uh, 25 and 50 to 50 and 100, 50 people indoors, 100 outdoors. Businesses that are limited to 25% capacity now would move to 50% capacity, uh, but still would not be able to sell or permit the consumption of food and drink at the facility. Uh, those are the businesses in, in paragraph eight. That's not food service and restaurants. Uh, paragraph eight deals mostly with uh, theaters and amusements, um, similar uh, businesses that, uh, that were limited originally. Camps would move to gathering limits, again, of 50 and 100 outdoors. Escape rooms can allow 10 people per game. Museums and galleries may reopen touch exhibits. Malls may reopen pedestrian concourses and return the tables and chairs inside. And sports uh, would also move to 50 people indoors and 100 outdoors with a similar number of spectators. At 60%, which is somewhere where we haven't gotten to, 60% of the total population receiving at least one dose of a COVID vaccine, we would bump up the gathering limits to 250 people indoors with no limit on the number of people outdoors. I should say that all of these, uh, all of these limits that we're talking about still include uh, uh, face coverings and social distancing as required in the governor's order, executive order. Uh, gathering limits would increase, I guess I said that 250 indoor, 
Most businesses would then move to 75% capacity and may sell food and drink for consumption while seated. Camps can increase gathering limits to 250 people indoors with no limit outdoors and permit campers from outside DMV. Sports, uh, youth sports and could play teams from outside, have participants from outside the DMV in the second phase two. Convention and banquet facilities will be limited to 50% of the facility's maximum capacity. That's part of the governor's order that we can't uh, go, we can't relax any further than that. Cigar and hookah bars may permit smoking outdoors. Food service establishments would move to 75% of maximum capacity, as would religious facilities, also 75% of maximum capacity. And sports could increase capacity for participants and spectators to 250 people indoors with no limit outdoors. And then the final phase is 50% of the population being fully vaccinated. Now we're talking about to all required doses, either two doses for Moderna and Pfizer and one dose for J&J, &J, plus the two weeks after your last dose. That's what we mean by fully vaccinated. When 50% of the uh, pop total population are fully vac vaccinated, then uh, the conduct of businesses in the county would simply follow the state or Maryland Department of Health requirements in place at that time. So then we move consistent to the state at that point in time. There is also a provision that if the health officer finds that after reviewing community transmission metrics, that continued reopening phases would be contrary to the public health, the health officer must report those concerns to the Board of Health and continuation to the next phase would be suspended pending a hearing before the Board of Health. Uh, there's also a provision in there with to Clarify, although Montgomery County follows the American Academy of Pediatrics for face covering guidelines for sports, that those guidelines include allowing the removal of, of face coverings during vigorous outdoor exercise in high heat, and high humidity conditions. And this amended regulation would take effect today at 5 p.m. if adopted as introduced. And I believe we have a public hearing with speakers scheduled next. We do, thank you. Um, sorry, colleagues, we're, we'll, we'll comment after the public hearing, Council Member Rumor, is that right? Okay. Um, Ms. Ms. Kennedy, could you introduce the speakers? Yes, I can. Good morning. Our first speaker today is Matthew Liver. Mr. Liver, you have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin when you're ready. Uh, President Hawker, fellow council members, thank you again for your opportunity to speak today. I'm again here to ask the council to immediately remove the mask mandate for athletes on the field of play for outdoor sports, as well as immediately allow teams from outside the DMV to play in Montgomery County. Today, the CDC is expected to release new guidelines regarding the use of masks outdoors that will eliminate the requirement in many cases. Consistent with that data and evidence I've previously provided the council, the CDC recognizes most outdoor activities, including sports, are extremely low risk activities regarding the transmission of the virus. A review paper published in the Journal of Infectious Disease by research at the University of California, San Francisco, found that less, less than 10% of transmission occurs outside. The dean of the Brown University School of Public Health said wearing masks indoors should still be required, but said outdoor infections are rare, and mostly tend to happen when large groups gather in confined spaces for long periods of time. Outdoor sports are clearly not confined, confined spaces, instead, instead are spread across large areas of space. While the new order does provide for the relaxing of mask requirements during high heat and humidity, the vagueness of the language leaves the interpretation confusing and will lead to different rules and enforcement across the county. I have also previously provided the council a report on outdoor tournament activities across the region showing tournaments are occurring with teams from across the country without incidents of outbreaks. The county has already lost the Potomac Moore Day tournament, which will have a large economic consequence for local business. Mm -hmm. If we continue to provide tournament operators of uh, summer events without a clear assurance that they will be able to operate the events with the teams from outside the DMV without a mask requirement, we are still at risk of losing those events as well. I ask the council to amend the new order to immediately provide relaxing of mask requirements for outdoor sports and allow teams from outside the DMV to play in the county. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Liver. Our next speaker is Matthew Wright. Mr. Wright, you will have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin when you're ready. Thank you. Well, first, I appreciate the discussion about reopening public libraries, and that's why I wanted to speak with you this morning. I respectfully request the council formally make plans to reopen public libraries as safely and expeditiously as possible. Much like community recreation centers that are now open, residents should gain access to the inside of public library buildings by following appropriate safety protocols. While nurses and doctors have been our first responders during the pandemic, public libraries must be the first responders for our recovery. Libraries have historically filled in the cracks of society. As you know, they serve the community in ways that extend beyond books, videos, and reading hours. Public libraries offer within their buildings an array of social services, such as reliable computer and internet access, literacy programs, U.S. citizenship classes, as well as housing and tax assistance. Opportunities to review library resources from inside the building are also particularly helpful for children, including my own. More than 80% of children are either a picture learner or a print learner, and it's no secret most students learned at a slower than normal rate over the last year. Matter of fact, according to a study by McKinsey and Company, the average pandemic-related learning loss for children is seven months. But Black students may fall behind by 10.3 months, Hispanic students by 9.2 months, and low-income students by more than a year. The study estimated pre-pandemic achievement gaps will exasperate by an additional 15 to 20 percent. But schools alone won't be able to close this gap. Public libraries must also be part of the solution. That's why I urge the council to prioritize making public libraries the first responders for our recovery and include them in spring reopening plans. County residents need access to our public library buildings, perhaps now more than ever. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Jonathan Harris. Mr. Harris, you have two minutes as well. You may begin. Uh, hello, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, uh, I, I've enjoyed listening to the comments. I've submitted a written testimony. It appears given the progress we're making, I'm very optimistic it will be moot, but in case it isn't, I just urge that you know once people have had adequate opportunity to get uh, vaccinated, that we reopen regardless of the number that uh, take on that opportunity, that we not uh, cause more suffering of the people who want to avoid COVID and get vaccinated, that the people who decide it's, uh, you know, they don't want to take the vaccine, they shouldn't hold the rest of us back. But uh, again, I know you have to allow, I recognize you do have to allow enough time for people to get the vaccine. Uh, that's all. You can read the rest of my testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Our next speaker is Katja Harper. Ms. Harper, you have two minutes. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, thank you, County Council, for allowing me to testify today. Um, I'm in favor of the proposed amendment um, with the caveat, as Mr. Matthew Libber said, that the mask mandate be rescinded for outdoor sports. Um, both the CDC and Dr. Fauci have recently said that the risk of outdoor transmission is exceedingly low and are expected to revise their guidance in line with the WHO guidance, uh, which stipulates that uh, masking during intense physical activity, particularly outdoors, uh, includes risks uh, that come from insufficient oxygen intake, which can result in fainting, nausea, and in extreme cases when masks are worn during exercise regularly, uh, brain damage. Masks uh, easily get sweat logged during exercise, which not only impedes their efficacy, but also promotes the growth of bacteria, which can lead to bacterial uh, pneumonia, which has been seen in several young people across the country. Um, last week, there was also a track student in Oklahoma who uh, passed out during a race. Um, and I agree that um, the stipulation of, you know, you can remove the mask if it's hot or humid is too vague um, and would lead to inconsistent application across the county, which could be unsafe. Um, given the low risk that COVID poses to those under 18, 
Um, I think it's particularly important to rescind this requirement for young people, but also for adults who feel more comfortable exercising outdoors uh, without a mask, whether the sport be organized um, or informal. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Amy Rohr. Ms. Rohr, you have two minutes. You may begin when you're ready. Good morning, council members. Uh, my name is Amy Rohrer here on behalf of the Maryland Hotel Lodging Association in support of the proposed amendment. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Hotels have been allowed to remain open throughout the pandemic. However, ongoing restrictions on gatherings and events, which are a significant driver of room revenue, have resulted in historically low occupancy and revenue losses for hotels. In the county, we have been and continue to operate below a break-even point with a 75% decrease in occupancy year over year and more than 200 million in room revenue loss, not including food and beverage revenues from meetings and events. I wanna point out that the industry was quick to adopt protocols that are in line with CDC guidelines to protect the health and safety of our employees and our guests. We are highly motivated to do everything we can to prevent the spread of COVID within our hotels, knowing our recovery depends on it, and many hotels are going beyond CDC guidelines. Meetings have begun to safely take place around the state and the country, and gathering restrictions have been eased in the jurisdictions surrounding Montgomery County. Prince George's County is already allowing banquets and conference centers to operate at 50% max capacity, and as of May 1st, DC will allow business meetings and conventions at 25% capacity, with city waivers required for any event over 250 people. Montgomery County Hotels hope to win some of the meetings business as it slowly returns, and phase one is a step in the right direction. Phase two, which would increase the gathering limit to 250 and allow for convention and banquet facilities to operate at 50% max capacity, will give us a chance to truly begin recovery. This will allow us to bring back employees and slowly return to being an economic generator for the county. Prior to the pandemic, hotels contributed $21 million in local hotel tax. We expect a return to full employment in 2023 and full recovery for the industry in 2024. We urge a favorable report and welcome any opportunity to partner with you in recovery. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Katarina Burns. Ms. Burns, you will have two minutes for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, good morning, council members, members, and thank you for allowing me to testify today. My name is Katarina Burns, and I am the general manager of the Gaithersburg Marriott Washingtonian Center, and I am speaking in support of today's amendment to the County Boards of Health Regulations. Our hotel is committed to providing guests and staff with <clears throat> an environment that's designed to meet the health and safety challenges presented by COVID-19. In following Marriott's commitment to clean guidelines, we have incorporated a host of new operational protocols recommended by the public of public health experts who have led Marriott's Global Cleanliness Council and helped usher in a new generation of industry safety standards. These enhanced protocols are not limited to sanitation and cleaning within hotel guest rooms and lobbies. They also include comprehensive guidelines that are tailor-made to safely accommodate banquets, meetings, and other functions that commonly take place in, within our event spaces. As an industry, we have remained nimble and we continue to adapt to the ever-evolving guidance from CDC and other public health authorities. We are confident that we can safely resume the type of activities that would be permitted under this amendment. I respectfully request that the council approve today's amendment. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Mary Lininger. Ms. Lininger, you have two minutes as well. You may begin when you're ready. Gotta be unmuted. There you go. <laughs> um, thank, 
There you go. You think after a year I would know better. Uh, thank you and good morning. My name is Mary Lineker and I am a resident of Bethesda since 2002. And while I am the director of events and sales for VizArts, I am testifying today as an individual. I want to thank you for considering today's resolution and I strongly urge you to support it. It's urgently needed by the events industry and by the Montgomery County venues. Uh, in fact, the, the guidelines for it were needed months ago. I recognize no one can predict the future and that COVID-19 remains an evolving crisis worldwide, but the lack of criteria and communication for metrics for determining guest counts and a safe reopening has devastated our industry, and we are actively losing business to neighboring counties, Virginia, and the District of Columbia. With no communication on what would be necessary to loosen restrictions, we actually have lost more clients for this wedding season than we did last year in the height of the pandemic. Many of those clients have waited patiently with us for over a year and have committed to following safety protocols and best practices on social distancing, masks, and contact tracing. However, in a vacuum of information, businesses like Gaithersburg Party Rental, a 50-year-old family business within the county, they've gone under, and there is a disturbing trend of underground venues popping up in places like Facebook Marketplace where rules and limitations are actively being skirted. I urge you to come to support the Fifth Amended Board of he Health Regulation. Over the past 24 hours, I've had two cancellations from guests who just couldn't wait anymore, a loss of $10,000 and three years of planning. In conclusion, here's a letter I received last night. Hi, Mary. We hope all is well. Due to the county not loosening restrictions, David and I are moving forward with another venue in Virginia. We're sad that we're losing our beloved VizArts. Our wedding is so close and we have to do what's best for us. We appreciate all you and Jackie have done for us since 2018 and we are so grateful. You are awesome. We'll never forget VizArts and maybe we'll use your venue for something in the future. Thank you and again, I urge you to take this up today. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is John Anderson. Mr. Anderson, you have two minutes and you may begin as soon as you're ready. Thank you for your time. My name is John Anderson and I own W. Curtis Draper, a 134 year old small businesses with stores in Bethesda and Washington, DC. I'm also the president of the board of the Premium Cigar Association. The PCA represents over 2,100 premium cigar retail stores across the country and over 200 manufacturing members. W. Curtis Draper is a tobacconist selling premium cigars and accessories. Our store also has a lounge where customers enjoy cigars, camaraderie, work, listen to music, or catch the latest game on our TV. If you were to visit either of our stores, you would realize immediately that we are unique. Often described as a jewelry store for men, and our lounge is often compared to the bar in the TV show Cheers, where everybody knows your name. Our cigar lounge is equipped with a state-of-the-art air purification system using HEPA filters as well as fresh air replacement, which can exchange 100% of the air in the lounge five times per hour. Our lounge is mandated to remain closed while the rest of the county reopens and restaurants are allowed up to 50% capacity. Our air handling system is better than anything you will find in any restaurant, yet we are still mandated to keep our lounges closed. We follow all social distancing guidelines, wear masks, has hand sanitizer placed about our stores, and our staff is constantly sanitizing surfaces to ensure we are a safe and clean place to visit. I have an outdoor patio, which I am currently not able to use, yet restaurants are allowed patio seating and customers can step outside to smoke during a break in their meal. Based on the upcoming new mask mandates from the CDC, our outdoor patio should be allowed to reopen immediately. There are only currently five local jurisdictions in the U.S. which have mandates to remain smoke-free. Virginia never shut down lounges and the rest of Maryland has allowed them to reopen. Our customers are going elsewhere to purchase and enjoy their cigars. In fact, one of my major competitors and friends told me he has never seen so many license plates in his six Virginia store parking lots. Our sales are down over 30% while online sales of premium cigars are exploding and Virginia same store sales are up 30%. Due to our declining sales, the county and state are losing tax revenue and our employees are working and earning less as our hours have been shortened by the closures. I would encourage the city council and board of health to allow cigar lounges to reopen following the same guidelines as restaurants. The arbitrary mandates to keep cigar lounges closed is not backed by good science. And if it were more of the country would mandate the same. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Steve Castro. Mr. Castro, you may begin when you're ready and you will have two minutes. Thank you. Um, Mr. President, uh, members of the uh, County Council, 
My name is Steve Castro. I grew up in Montgomery County. I'm a graduate of the United States Naval Academy. I'm a combat veteran and I'm co-owner of Davida Cigars. My brother and I started Davida Cigars in 1996 and have worked very hard to build our small business. We have three stores in Montgomery County and employ 18 people in the county. Our employees count on us to get a paycheck every two weeks. We never stopped paying them when we were completely shut down for three months last year. We weren't even allowed to do curbside, and yet we continue to fully pay health insurance to our full-time employees at no cost to them, and we contributed to an employee retirement fund like we do every year. We have done the right thing for our employees, and we have done the right thing for the county. We have when we were finally allowed to open back up our stores to customers, we continue to follow all the CDC and public health guidelines because it is the right thing to do. But to continue... But but to continue to ban smoking inside premium cigar stores is not the right thing to do. We have better ventilation systems than bars and restaurants. We do not serve food or alcoholic beverages. We are not a bar. At 50% capacity, we may have four to 10 customers smoking in the store at one time. Unlike other smoking establishments, premium cigar smokers do not share the same cigar. We don't allow cigarette smoking or hookah smoking in the stores. We don't sell vape products. We are very different than other smoking venues. Our customers are spread out by six feet. We have great ventilation systems. We follow strict cleaning practices. We've had no issues or problems with these practices in other counties in Maryland. The state of Michigan this year took a similar stance banning indoor smoking. They quickly reversed their policy once they realized premium cigar stores were not the problem and had better ventilation systems than bars and restaurants. I encouraged the county council to come visit one of our stores and see for yourself. I asked the council to amend the county health order and allow premium cigar stores, once you get to that 60% uh, vaccination capacity, which I think is a good idea, to reopen indoor smoking. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for keeping the county safe. And thank you for the consideration in doing this in the county. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. President, that wraps up the speakers for this public hearing. Uh, thank you so much to all our speakers. Thank you, Ms. Kennedy. Thanks to all who submitted written testimony as well and contacted us directly. The public hearing is now closed. Uh, now we can move on to action and then uh, before we have discussion, I need a motion to uh, enact the resolution. So moved. Second. Second. Council Member Reamer moves and Council Member Friedson seconds. Um, Council Member Reamer, you're the first I'll be brief. Thank you so much. Well, they want to thank uh, the, our health team for their advice on crafting this this mm -hmm. resolution. Uh, this new health order is certainly for me precisely what I've been hoping for for several weeks now, and I think it will allow our community to, you know, plan our community and our businesses to plan for a different summer. Um, with the prospect of the CDC issuing new mask guidance today. I think we'll need to come back and, you know, just address that based on what the CDC says. So, uh, you know, I hear about that and, um, you know, work may not be done there, but uh, this is a paradigm shift for us. I think it's innovative. Uh, I think it'll, it's a, a really an example for how to craft this policy. And I, I thank everybody who had a hand in making it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Friedson. Thank you. I echo the comments. Really appreciate all the work of the public health team, all colleagues, in particular Councilmember Albernaz, uh, who uh, Council Vice President Albernaz, uh, who uh, really has uh, uh, played a significant role here on behalf of the council and also Council President uh, for all your work. I, I know we have a, a, a couple of modest amendments that we may be uh, taking up, but this public health regulation is a significant step forward. It reflects the positive situation that we're in thanks to the sacrifice of our residents and all of the work that has gone in it's reflective of public health guidance that we continue to uh, receive and i think that it is uh, a, a, the beginning of a new day with uh, a clear metric based uh, and transparent process that we're going to gradually move to basically reopening and return to some sense of normalcy for residents and families, allow businesses, families, and organizations to prepare uh, over the next uh, few weeks. Uh, I think it's important to note the, the different phases. Uh, one will start today 
uh, when when the order is approved, this has been uh, noted, the 60% uh, threshold, uh, you know, it would be helpful if we could have our public health team describe uh, a, a timeline based on current uh, projections, um, what the expectation is for how long that would take, and then based on uh, where we are at the current 50% of total population vaccinated, uh, how long it would take for uh, the uh, final phase of this uh, public health regulation uh, to, to be reached so that uh, residents can understand it. So I, I could ask that now, Mr. President, or we could uh, wait and turn no, to the health team to, to describe that. Okay, great. Dr. Stoddard, thank you. Yeah, if you could just describe, obviously we'd start today um, uh, uh, with the 50% uh, threshold. Could you describe based on our current progress? I see Dr. Gales as well joining us. Welcome back. Um, and then when we would be to full vaccination, of course, these are projections uh, based on our current progress, but I think it's helpful for residents to understand uh, and be able to have a, an expectation of it. Well, I think the, the first measure, I think we're looking at probably two to three weeks, best case scenario. Again, a lot of that will be informed by the capacity of doses that are provided to us and being able to do that. Um, I think achieving, so I think, I think getting from 50 to 60% will be, uh, happen quicker for first doses. Again, getting there than it will take for us to get to 50% in terms of the population fully vaccinated, given that that will be contingent upon, you know, the type of doses that people receive. Obviously, if they're receiving two doses, that's a fixed three week or four week period there between, um, the for initial dose and then completing that versus a one one shot deal. Um, so I think in terms of moving from 50 to 60% in terms of first doses, based upon how we've been moving so far, we're probably looking at a two to three week window. And then the jump from uh, the second phase to the third phase, probably looking somewhere in the, you know, again, best case scenario, if there's a windfall of doses, a month to six weeks. I can actually give some numbers on this. Uh, so a uh, week ago today, we we're at 46.9%. Today, we are at 51.2%. So that was 5.1% in one week. So assuming we hold steady at that, you know, in two weeks, as Dr. Gale said, we, we should reach 60%. Now, we expect as you move up the chain of people getting first doses, you will slow down a little bit. So two to three weeks, I think, is a, probably a very good guess. Now, we crossed the 50% threshold of first doses today, meaning that the person who was the 50th percentile person sometime yesterday or the weekend will be four, three to four weeks, depending on which dose they got, out from their second dose. And so that would be the soonest that we could possibly reach the third phase would be four weeks from the day we had 50 percentile of the first, you know, of the first doses. But more likely, I think, as Dr. Gale said, four to six weeks is probably a fair estimate. So the beginning the end of May, early, early June. And, and at the latest, that would be two weeks following the Correct. second dose. So that would be six weeks, you know, at the earliest. If we had in Johnson and Johnson and Pfizer vaccines, for instance, this week, you know, that would uh, cut down that, that timeline uh, fr from there. Correct. Correct. Terrific. I just think it's important. So two to three, we're going to start the first phase today, five o'clock when this goes into effect. The second phase, two to three weeks. Uh, the third phase, we believe, based on uh, where things are in six weeks or less. Uh, and the sooner we get there is based on how many of our residents show up to their second uh, doses. If we can get closer to 100%, which I believe uh, we are than the national uh, average, uh, and how many we can encourage uh, our, our friends, loved ones, and, and neighbors to get more vaccines over the next uh, few weeks. I think that's important and a key element to this order and why it's important, as the council president noted earlier, it's uh, to try to incentivize all of us to encourage each other to get a vaccine since it benefits uh, broader public health. Uh, last question, uh, the notification, the formal notification, how will the council be formally notified when we hit each threshold besides obviously following the uh, vaccine dashboard on the website and how will the public then uh, be notified? At what point will that phase be official and how will folks know about it? Uh, so you will receive an official memo from the health officer stating, you know, similar to one that you uh, 
I think I'm not sure if you received a date. You re will receive a formal memo that states where we stand in terms of the percentage uh, uh, where we stand. And so you will receive a formal copy of that that will likely be posted online or communicated to the general public, um, letting them know we have reached that measure in addition to you all receiving that formal memo within that. And I would also like to add is that certainly we, this has been a great optimistic, positive conversation today, but to emphasize that all of this continues to be contingent upon us moving in the right direction in terms of community transmission, because I mean, uh, hopefully we won't have to revisit these conversations if we do see a move in the opposite direction and trending in a negative way, we would have to revisit some of these provisions. Uh, and those types of measures that we look for in terms of community transmission would be consistent with the same measures we've looked at since last year, test positivity, hospitalization rates, fatality rates, as well as case, uh, case rates per 100,000 residents. Terrific. Appreciate that clarification, uh, and obviously we'll continue to follow uh, pu public health. The, the, the second part of that question, I just want to make sure the public understands this. When the memo comes to the council, that officially triggers it. Is there a process that the council staff, executive staff, each of us is going to undertake to make sure the public is uh, aware of uh, the memo coming over? How How is that going to work? Where exactly should folks be? Uh, looking to, to seek that information? Will there be a formal release that goes out to the public? How is that process going to work? Uh, I would defer to Ms. Kench and Mr. Drummer on that piece. Thank you. Um, good morning, Council Member Friedson. Uh, when I was drafting the uh, Board of Health regulation, my idea was that uh, Dr. Gales would submit a memo to Council President Tucker and Council Vice President Albernos with copy to the rest of the Council um, and notifying that we had met that particular threshold, at which point we would also have a press release that went out. Um, and we would also post on all of our websites um, and have a social media launch. Terrific. So from an official standpoint, once the memo is received uh, from the public health officer, from Dr. Gales to the council, president, vice president, uh, the phase would begin, and then we would employ all of our communications and outreach to make sure that folks are aware of that. Yes. Terrific. Thank you for that. Thanks for your work on tracking this with Mr. Drummer. Uh, terrific collaboration and coordination. Really appreciate it. And Thank you uh, to our public health team and uh, to colleagues. Appreciate it, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member. Yeah, I guess we missed our chance to have a set of Ginsu knives ready for whichever resident got us to 50% over the weekend, but maybe we could have one for whoever gets us to 60%. Council Member Glass. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, just real quick, I, I, I support these changes and appreciate all of my colleagues' work to get us here, and of course, all the doctors as well for your input and your insight. And, and the bottom line here is, quite frankly, uh, as we as a community get healthier and get vaccinated, we will open up as a community. And so the onus is on all of us. If, if individuals and businesses want to open up, encourage your neighbors, your family members, uh, and also your patrons to get vaccinated. It's just that simple. And so uh, as uh, as we have these conversations over the weeks, I, I uh, will, uh, I look forward to more encouraging news, recognizing we still need to social distance, we still need to wear masks. There is still a responsibility that each of us has. And we need to be mindful that we're not out of the woods, but uh, we need to be mindful that we're all in this together, which has been a mantra from the very beginning of this pandemic and this regulation uh, as I think a, a, the, the most true testament of that. As we get healthier, we will open up. And so um, thank you for all of the collective work here uh, from everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Council of Vice President Albernoz. Thanks, Mr. President. Just very quickly reiterating, I, I will be proposing the two modest amendments in just a second, but first want to reiterate my appreciation and thanks to the public health team and Dr. Stoddard uh, for continuing to be nimble and provide this new framework. Um, as is always the case, as, as Dr. Gales acknowledged in his testimony earlier today with the general update and briefing on where we are with the virus, uh, the CDC will be announcing new guidelines later this afternoon with regards to outdoor activity. And as has always been the case since the beginning of the pandemic, 
uh, we stand ready to adjust as necessary as we learn more uh, at the national level and as guidance is provided to the local level. Um, and so to some of the testimony we heard earlier today uh, from community members, uh, we, we will adjust as necessary as we have since the beginning of the pandemic, should there be additional CDC guidelines with regards to mask use outdoors. Um, with that in line, Mr. Council President, uh, I do have two amendments that um, I'd like to push forward. Uh, and first, I thank the public health team for providing feedback and input into these two amendments, which I greatly appreciate as well. Uh, the first amendment is to move the consumption of food and drink uh, through concessions to phase one rather than phase two. Uh, this puts us in line with all other neighboring jurisdictions and uh, is consistent with the best practices that have been administered by uh, restaurants. Uh, and we continue to encourage um, businesses, if they have questions, uh, to certainly uh, reach out to our public health team because they've been tremendously responsive and to adhere to all other guidelines with regards to social distancing as are stipulated uh, in, the, uh, in the public health order. Um, the change here is, is that it moves from phase two to phase one. Uh, and the second amendment is with regards to the use of um, face coverings outdoors while engaged in sports. As Mr. Drummer noted, we have been uh, referring to the American Academy of Pediatrics um, because we do believe that has been a best practice and provides some reasonable guidelines. But with regards to the provision of addressing issues that come with the possibility of bona fide safety risks due to high heat and humidity when wearing masks, uh, we're adding, uh, proposing the addition of a provision that removes the reference to the American Academy of Pediatrics so that we're more clear um, that this applies to both uh, children, youth, and adults, uh, as well as they are um, um, engaging in sports activities. So uh, with that, I'd like to move these two amendments, Mr. President. Is there a second? Second. second. Council Member Fries and seconds. Um, all those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. Great. Is there any other discussion of the amended resolution? Regulation? Um, okay. Uh, all those, uh, I think we need a, uh, sorry, Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? Yes. Mr. Glass? Yes. Mr. Glass votes yes. Mr. Jawanda? Yes. Mr. Jawanda votes yes. Mr. Reamer? Yes. Mr. Reamer votes yes. Ms. Navarro? Yes. Ms. Navarro votes yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Friedson? Yes. Mr. Friedson votes yes. Mr. Katz? Yes. Mr. Katz votes yes. Mr. Abernos? Yes. Mr. Abernos votes yes. And Mr. Hucker? Yes. Mr. Hucker votes yes. Motion passes. We have an amended Board of Health regulation to prevent the spread of COVID. Uh, thanks, colleagues, and thanks to our public health team for all your hard work on this. Thanks to the Council Vice President and everybody who got this across the, uh, the finish line there. Now we can move to interview Ms. Kathy Durbin for Director of the Alcohol Beverage Services Department. Welcome, Ms. Durbin, and welcome to the CAO who's here to provide an introduction. Um, thank you very much, uh, Council President Hucker. Um, I know uh, Ms. Durbin does not need an introduction to all of you, but um, to the to the public um, who might be participating in the hearing, people should know that uh, Ms. Durbin has been a lifelong resident of Montgomery County. She made her 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 um, introduction to the world at Suburban Hospital, so she has been here since day one. Um, she has been an employee of the county government for more than twenty years. Um, she has risen through the ranks of the of through what was then the Department of Liquor Control, now Alcoholic Beverage Services, um, to now be our nominee for the director position. Uh, when the county executive was going through the selection process, um, he wanted to make sure that we had a director who was well known in the community and who knew this um, aspect of county government um, the best having um, spent now years working with our licensees, there is no one I think better positioned to help our community 
in this segment of our community, the hospitality industry, the restaurant industry, um, get back on its feet after the pandemic. She has been working with our licensees for years. She understands them. She has their respect. She understands their concerns. She knows our, our, um, our ABS stores, um, the leadership of those stores, the leadership of the department. She knows um, the contractors who we deal with in getting um, the product um, into the warehouse and then out to the licensees. So um, I hope you will concur with the, um, with the executive that there is no one better positioned right now to lead alcoholic beverage services than Kathy Durbin. So I'm proud to be here um, with her and to um, recommend her confirmation to all of you. Thank you so much, Mr. Madalino. Um, and Ms. Durbin, before I forget, I just want to thank you for, I don't think you've been in front of us in quite a while, and I want to thank you for all your leadership during the pandemic and for the risk and the hard work that's been borne by the ABS employees. We, as you know, we only recently have had the vaccines to extend to the ABS department, but your staff worked through very difficult days at risk to themselves. Unfortunately, several fell ill and some stores had to close, but we're very grateful for the sacrifices that you and your staff put in um, for our residents during some very difficult months. I have six questions for you, and then we'll see if my colleagues have any additional questions. Um, first, why do you want to become the director of the Department of Alcohol Beverage Services? Um, well, thank you, Mr. President. It's nice to see you, and thank you for um, mentioning our store staff because they have uh, put in a lot of work uh, this past year, so we really appreciate that. Um, so I invested my entire career working in the alcohol industry through hospitality, management, prevention, regulation, and alcohol policy. So most of it has been done in Montgomery County uh, at the division chief for LRE the past 15 years and um, before that community outreach manager for the Department of Liquor Control. I have a proven track record of um, positive change, affecting positive change, um, protecting the public health and safety, and meeting the needs of both consumers and the licensed establishments. Um, I would like to take it to the next level and um, act as, instead of acting as director of ABS, be the director of ABS. Um, thank you. You've gotten into some of this, but please share with us your background, knowledge, and experience related to planning, developing, implementing, and evaluating policies and interpreting guidelines for programs and services designed to regulate the distribution and sale of all alcoholic beverages. Um, thank you for that. It's a great big question. Um, but um, So I'll say that our policies and programs um, have been nationally recognized. There are dozens of programs we have developed over the years. Um, I'll tell you uh, a story about a program that's uh, especially near and dear to my heart and uh, also very important to the business community, and it will probably incorporate everything in this question. Um, when I was younger, and I know today there's been a lot of talk about age, so we won't go there, but when I was younger, I was um, managing businesses, uh, bartending uh, in Bethesda for quite a while at a business called Dirty Nellie's, um, and I managed the bands there and uh, paid for college through uh, working at Dirty Nellie's. was a great place um, to work. Uh, I also was working for the Restaurant Association of Maryland at the time, and I became a state-certified um, alcohol trainer. I helped them write um, the first uh, server training course uh, called Beverage Effective Server Training with the Restaurant Association of Maryland. Um, so a few years later, as I um, continued some of my work with um, certification, I became a community outreach manager over at uh, the Department of Liquor Control and later the division chief for LRE. And it's, it's funny because at that time, it just all hit me, all the server training. It costs a lot of money for people to take the server training. It's um, something that's mandated by state that, that there's at least one person on um, duty at all times in the businesses um, to have this training. And sometimes, sometimes the training really isn't relevant to that worker, and it's not – um, focused on what that business is about. So uh, I developed a program called ALERT, and it's the alcohol law um, enforcement regulatory training. So it's a free training. It complements the state certification. We started it about, I'd say about 13 years ago, 
um, here in LRE. And um, we started holding monthly classes uh, for anybody in the industry, anybody that works in our industry to, to learn and understand what you can do in Montgomery County when you open a business. Or even if you're just, want it, just thinking about working in a business, you don't have to be the owner or the manager, you can be the, the server, the seller, um, you can be the attorney that's representing that business. Uh, we've expanded the training over the years in different languages. We go into the communities, people come to us. Uh, we've had the opportunity of, of going virtual this year and uh, creating some really engaging tools, uh, using some tools um, so that people in the training can also understand better and ask questions. So um, it's just so comprehensive and it has done a lot, I think, for our community and our business. It's been a great program. We're gonna continue to grow it. Uh, the results have been outstanding in many respects. It's, um, you know, our goal is for businesses uh, to succeed in Montgomery County. And so we created a pre-licensing program out of this. Anybody that comes to us with an application will uh, have the opportunity to take this free training and uh, we walk them through it. It's a big part of our program. Um, we uh, have grown connections between our staff and the businesses, and it's all about the whole department. It's not just about licensing. So they'll know how to order product. They'll learn more about the warehouse. They're, they'll learn about our system. Um, and it's become very uh, much of a relationship trust building as well for the businesses. Uh, it's been just an innovation in licensing. Uh, it's become a national model. Um, actually, throughout the different jurisdictions in the state of Maryland, they've created different versions of this training. Uh, and I think that it's also built the capacity for the businesses. And when they go before the Board of Licensed Commissioners um, to uh, apply and to be um, assessed for a license to see whether their license is going to be approved, um, we see an outstanding difference. I mean, we've raised the capacity. Um, and the standards for the liquor board hearing. So um, I think that this is just one story. I have lots of them. And someday we, we could talk about all these great stories that have happened throughout the years and have become programs and um, it helped us to create uh, alcohol policy and teach other people how to create policy within their business. Thank you. Well, your answer anticipated this question as well, but can you tell us about your experience working with distributors, licensees, the liquor industry, and restaurant associations, and maintaining effective community relations programs? Sure. So um, I uh, worked for the Restaurant Association of Maryland for many years. I was executive director of the Montgomery County Restaurant Association um, uh, back in the day, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Um, I was pretty young and um, had the opportunity to learn from um, many of the small businesses um, in our community, uh, went to Annapolis and helped lobby for small business, uh, learned a lot about, you know, their fears. At that time, it was the fears of uh, chain restaurants. So it was the on-premise chains and not being able to compete with those businesses. And there were some laws that were put into, um, into effect to help to protect those small businesses. Um, today, it's more local. Things have changed. But um, so I learned a lot through the Restaurant Association and continue to have um, great relationships. I uh, have been the president of the Maryland Alcohol Licensing uh, Association for the past four years. So I work with all the jurisdictions in the state and all the liquor boards. Um, so we have a very close relationship with industry in all forms, um, with wholesalers throughout the state uh, and with other folks that represent um, businesses. So it's really important to maintain those relationships. And so we can get a ahead of it so that we have more effective licensing for our businesses and very proud of the fact that we've been able to do that for our businesses in Montgomery County. Thank you. A focus of uh, ABS in recent years has been improving reliability and customer satisfaction on the wholesale side and enhancing profitability on the retail side. Please describe what improvements ABS still needs to make in these areas and what your strategy would be to accomplish that. Um, thank you. That's, you know, it's been tough to measure some of the changes and um, things that have happened the past year, of course, because, because there's been a pandemic. And so um, there's been a, a, a lot of, um, you know, fits and starts, especially when it comes to alcohol product. But I would say that uh, we've already seen some improvements um, 
County stat has put out the customer um, satisfaction surveys that are quite high. They're looking um, much better in recent um, couple of years, especially this year. The survey looks pretty good. And also the wholesale reliability numbers from through County stat are well over 99% um, for deliver um, deliveries. And so we're starting in a good place. We still can get better. There's a lot. Um, there's a, a lot of. Uh, opportunity to to grow and help the businesses as we open and reopen the businesses and act as a resource for these businesses. So um, I would like to dig deeper. I would like to hear from our audience, engage the community, um, and really understand how we can be better, what we can do to grow, and um, when, whether it's, you know, marketing, helping them. One of the best um, I think one of the best programs we've been able to design is the local program the last couple of years. And it started with licensing and it's grown into our retail stores. So many of the local producers um, and manufacturers can, um, can start in our liquor stores. And so instead of knocking on 25 doors or 26 doors with including Poolsville, they can, um, they can go into a system and we can help them grow. So I think there's lots of uh, opportunity for growth and movement, but we are starting at a pretty good place um, as we reopen. Thank you. If appointed, how will you position this role to work on racial equity and social justice issues? Uh, so ABS has already facilitated three meetings with the uh, uh, racial equity and social justice um, team in the county. Uh, we have formed our own team who will be identifying and reviewing processes and policies um, with that racial equity lens. Uh, I've, one of the things that uh, has been really um, exciting for us this year is one of our um, lead roles in that team in ABS has helped us um, create an a, a, a Amplify Black Voices program in our stores. And so we've brought um, Black-owned wine and spirits as well as prominent Black voices within the mainstream um, of products to uh, virtual tastings and webinars online, and we continue to grow that program. So very excited about the direction that we're, we're heading in and having those conversations. Uh, thanks. And are there any current or potential conflicts of interest of which we should be aware? No. <laughs> no. Terrific. Okay. Uh, Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you, Ms. Durbin. I. I actually have no questions. I just wanted to say very publicly that I agree, and I know I, I agree uh, with exactly what Mr. Madalino said about you. And, and I'd like to add a few things as well. I I think we're extremely fortunate to uh, to have uh, Kathy um, want to do this. I know of no one who knows more about uh, ABS uh, and uh, than than she does. I think that uh, she will do an unbelievably good job as director. And candidly, I, I just look forward to vote for her. She she is somebody that, that uh, it was, as Rich mentioned, that she's lived in Montgomery County and for her whole life. I like to tease her that she's probably related to half a rock bell. <laughs> So, and, and, and she probably agrees with that. And, and, uh, but she is someone who has absolutely proven and, and, uh, Mr. President, you being on public safety as, as, as well as uh, the vice president on public safety, we have heard because it comes under public safety's uh, committee, uh, uh the uh, alcohol beverage services. You, we have heard firsthand from many people who, even when they are not as pleased as, as they would like to be with, what goes on with uh, alcohol beverage services, they have always mentioned. But I have to tell you, Kathy Durbin does a great job. That's, that's what I've heard time and time again. I sincerely thank her for wanting to do this job, and I sincerely look forward to voting for her. Thank you very much. And thank you. Council, uh, Council Vice President Albert Nose. Thank you. Um, I know there's been debate over this department over the years, but what is not debatable is what an outstanding public servant Kathy has been. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with her on several projects when I used to work in the executive branch. And as Councilmember Katz said, he's absolutely right. The feedback from the community has always been extraordinarily positive. And uh, this department is a very customer service focused industry, very front facing. 
uh, and, and it's critical to have strong partnerships and alliances with uh, the restaurants and distributors and providers. Um, and Ms. Durbin has that in spades, uh, those strong relationships, and I think will add a high degree of credibility. And I hope, Mr. Madalino, we can support her by continuing the move forward to stay ahead of the curve with regards to technology and innovation in this space, um, because as strong as Ms. Durbin is and as confident I am in her leadership, uh, she will not be able to do this on her own, uh, particularly as we transition back over this next year from the pandemic and all that that brings. So uh, this is a, a great appointment, 1,000% support it, um, but I know Ms. Durbin's going to need a lot more help <laughs> uh, to be able to meet her goals and objectives and, frankly, those of the county executive as well. So I enthusiastically look forward to supporting this nomination. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Reamer. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the in interview. Great questions. Um, Ms. Durbin has always been a bright spot at DLC. You know, all of our inquiries and comments and, you know, she's been a, a creative thinker, uh, but also uh, very effective with the licensees. Um, so I appreciate her, her taking this on. Ms. Durbin, you'll have big challenges ahead and I continue to think we've got major reforms needed at the department and, um, you know, starting with operating profitability for the retail stores, which I think continues to be an issue, but uh, certainly look forward to working with you. You've, again, always been very professional um, and knowledgeable and, and personable. And uh, I'm sure that the, uh, the licensees are gonna appreciate your work in this role. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Member Glass. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, Ms. Durbin, uh, it's a pleasure to, to see you here because you and I first met in the mid-2000s when I was trying to organize a street festival in downtown Silver Spring, and uh, Jackie Greenbaum of Jackie's Restaurants wanted to sell cocktails for, for the residents celebrating, and we didn't know how to do it. Uh, and uh, DLC didn't know how to do it because it really hadn't been requested before, but we figured it out and we were able to celebrate all our small businesses and, uh, and uh, you know, a, a lot has happened since. And then you and I got to know each other on the Nighttime Economy Task Force talking about liquor reform here in Montgomery County. Um, and so uh, all of that is uh, you and you and my backdrop. But um while that is the past, I do have a, a substantive question for you as we look to the future, quite frankly. Uh, so the, the, the pandemic has uh, allowed for various changes and, and you know, take out of, uh, take out of uh, you know, cocktails from restaurants as more and more delivery has taken place. And so I'm curious what your thoughts are. What opportunities should we uh, continue or seize upon uh, in this new normal, recognizing that we've been doing a lot of work to help our small businesses? Uh, wh what do you think we can keep doing or even doing better? Well, so we did, there is a bill and, and, uh, that has, is passing or has passed uh, in Maryland, so it will become effective in July. And that will um, continue these permissions with carry out and, um, and delivery for the on-premise restaurants. Uh, there's a sunset provision, um, so it, it, for two years right now, we'll see we'll see how that works out. Um, I just moderated a panel, a national panel yesterday afternoon on this very topic, the per permissions from around the country that have been extended to the businesses and the communities to help um, businesses uh, survive and to try to make it through as they reopen. Um, and so... I think that it's important we continue some of these practices. Um, we now can take a pause and take a, you know, take some time to look at um, what is being permitted and how we can keep the community safe. We're actually working on a program with Brown Foreman right now called Pause, the Pause Campaign, and um, so we have stickers that are made to give to the businesses that have drinks for carryout um, to put on that um, that container to say, "Do not drink and drive. Pause. Think about it. Stop and think about." you know, what um, what you're doing if you're transporting, if you're just picking up from curbside. So I think that all of these permissions are something we should encourage and allow. We just make sure we do it in a, a, a safe manner. Um, within less than two days, we had 500 permits 
um, free permits online for businesses to um, to allow them to have carryouts. And we, we created those permits so we know who's doing it and who wants to do it. But we also did a mystery shop last um, last fall. And the mystery shop was to check to see how the businesses were doing, who was doing it. Um, it was just a snapshot, but we found that 66% of the businesses did not ask for IDs. So these are things, This was, these are educational tools. So I think that we need to just keep having these conversations with the businesses, keep our community safe. If we have alcohol consumption areas, make sure there's somebody accountable for that area. If we extend, they'll continue to extend licenses out. Let's continue to do it in a safe manner and make sure somebody's accountable. I um, actually labeled a meeting for this Friday, who wants to talk about outdoor dining and have had 30 participants already from around the county. So we can talk about next steps and how we can continue to create a, a social economy, not just nighttime economy, but a social economy for Montgomery County and grow it. So I'm very Thank interested you. in all that. Uh Great response. I, I appreciate the, the thoughtfulness and uh, the, the conversations that you will con that you're continuing to have, quite frankly. And, you know, my views are are well known on this subject. And so I I think as we continue uh, evolving, continuing talking with our businesses and working through this new normal, uh, I think that there are opportunities uh, for us to uh, shed some of our past here uh, as a, a liquor control county a liquor control yeah you know, liquor control county uh and uh, do better and so uh you're clearly already walking walking in that direction and look forward to walking with you uh because our, our residents and our business owners uh want change so look forward to working with you thank you thank you council member juana hi miss durbin good to see you and mm -hmm. uh good day glad that we're going to be able to uh move you forward uh you've been doing the job i'm um, doing a great job and uh just want to appreciate that i'm glad councilmember glass mentioned the nighttime economy task force he and i uh we're, we're not only seat buddies on the council we were seat buddies for many of those sessions uh, back in the day um and i know uh, i think that's probably where i first met you um and uh, we made a lot of progress uh, i'm a big supporter of our stores i think uh, the public health reasons the reforms that have been put in place uh, we're heading in the right direction. Uh, there's always more to do and continuous improvement. And I know that's uh, something you and I have talked about and you, you take that seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, so look forward to, to tackling those challenges and opportunities uh, with you uh, as we move forward. So uh, no, no uh, big questions. Just didn't want to let this pass without saying very happy to see this move forward and looking forward to continue to work with you as we come out of this, uh, this pandemic and, try to build back better. So thanks a lot. Thanks. Council member uh, Navarro. Mr. President, well, uh, Mr. Durbin, it is uh, so wonderful to be able to um, interview you and of course support you and want to express my appreciation for all the years that you have been working in this space. You've done a phenomenal job and <clears throat> that's obviously why you're here in front of us. Um, I also wanted to Suggest, of course, that as you're working with restaurants and really as we keep talking about issues around equity, uh, we know that our immigrant community uh, has just, you know, it's just very vibrant when it comes to restaurants and when it comes to the social econ you know, economy that you were just describing. And so I urge you, of course, as you're working with, with these uh, partners, these businesses um, that, you know, uh, language and particularly targeted outreach to make sure that everybody is aware of what is required and perhaps what kind of supports they might need. Um, so I urge you also to, um, to look into that and I'm sure you're already doing some of it, but you know, to enhance and strengthen that because I think that many times, um, I know my office, you know, constantly hears from, uh, restaurants in, in our district, whether it be, you know, in Wheaton, um, and in other areas, um, uh, with questions and just, you know, I know a lot has been going on with all the different uh, uh, guidelines and restrictions, et cetera. But I think in terms of when we speak about, you know, the issue of, of equity, paying close attention to that and thinking of innovative, creative ways uh, to constantly uh, share that information as well in a culturally appropriate and linguistically appropriate fashion um, would be awesome because we need all of those small businesses, all of those restaurants to to be able to, of course, uh, thrive 
uh, and be there um, post COVID-19. So um, I know that, that, that you've already begun to do some of that work, but just encourage you to, to continue to strengthen that piece and, uh, you know, look forward to, to voting for you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, no other requests. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time Mr. today. President. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Councilmember Rice, you're right. My thank bad. you. No, 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 it's all, it's, it's perfect. All right. I'm, I'm just going to join the echo of, uh, of just praises to you. Um, Kathy, I remember when we held that event at universities at Shady Grove uh, and had an opportunity to talk to folks there and just seeing the interaction that you continue to have between the purveyors. Uh, and I think it was Councilmember Katz who said it first and the respect that you have been able to garner over the years uh, for your great work, understanding that it was a difficult room. Uh, a lot yeah. of people very passionate about uh, what they wanted to see in terms of reforms and changes, but you handled yourself just so well. And it's obvious that that is going to help to continue to carry us as we continue to evolve uh, as a department. And so from that perspective, it really just is a testament to your work over the years, uh, your continued devotion to building relationships, understanding that those are the way we get through some of the tough and difficult decisions we have. You have to have people who like you and respect you. And you've certainly done a tremendous job uh, with that, along with your great work ethic. And so look forward to supporting you. And really thank you for your dedication to Montgomery County all of these years. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Friedson. Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, I will uh, echo all the comments made about you, Ms. Durbin, uh, broadly and specifically during this pandemic in particular, which has been a really challenging time for licensees and for residents and really appreciate your willingness to be creative and to work with businesses and to think outside the box and uh, work with us uh, and, and, and respond to our uh, thoughts and ideas and uh, questions and, uh, and many times, uh, responding late at night uh, and uh, early in the morning and on the weekends and, and, and everywhere in between. Uh, your uh, response and responsiveness to uh, our businesses have really been uh, helpful. It's been a, a breath of fresh air. I appreciate uh, Councilmember Glass mentioning some of the changes that have been made. I appreciate all council colleagues that signed on to a letter pushing that some of those changes uh, continue. I appreciate your willingness to implement them because uh, there are a number of changes that started uh, with uh, our county uh, and uh, were, were adopted uh, elsewhere. And, and mm -hmm. uh, not always easy. Uh, change is sometimes hard. Uh, and so I appreciate that. And I will also say when it comes to the uh, streeteries and the street signs and the picnics in the park and all of the changes that have been made that have been alcohol related uh, during the uh, pandemic, most of which to help residents get through a challenging time, provide them with safe outlets and uh, for businesses to be able uh, to survive. I appreciate your uh, moving to a culture of yes and helping to move county government to a culture of yes. It hasn't just been on the alcohol piece of it. It's been on uh, opening a street to people instead of cars and then what activities we allow uh, in that street. But you've really been at the center of many of those uh, conversations where we've uh, started with yes and figured out how as opposed to starting with no uh, and state why not. Uh, and I hope that that continues. I know that it will. You are a highly deserving uh, uh, nominee. I think you'll be an effective uh, leader, my views on the the, uh, uh, the role of the department and our alcohol policies are, are certainly well documented. Uh, but as long as we are uh, in this uh, environment and uh, we have the policy uh, that we have, I have the utmost confidence in your leadership and your ability to uh, not only manage the department, but to work with all of the relevant stakeholders, uh, namely our uh, licensees and local businesses uh, to be able to deliver, to be able to uh, provide them with the uh, support and responses uh, that you need. So thank you, and uh, I uh, congratulate you on the nomination. Look forward to working with you uh, in this uh, highly uh, deserving uh, role that uh, looks like you're about to take. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, sounds like a landslide, Kathy. Um, thank you so much for your uh, 
your time. Like Council Member Glass, I've always appreciated how helpful you've been at adding uh, flexibility and responding very quickly to constituent issues and helping us secure permits for Silver Spring Restaurant Week and our Silver Screens Outdoor Movie Series and many other schemes that we cooked up over the years. Um, I know I learned a lot about the department when I served on the Economic Matters Committee in the General Assembly and developed an appreciation for how complicated alcohol laws are and as uh, how much as 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 uh, as much as residents and business want modernization and reform, which you've been very supportive of, how central alcohol laws are to uh, ensuring public health and safety. And compared with so many other jurisdictions that have had long lasting and deep seated problems with their alcohol regulations uh, around the state. Uh, I learned in Annapolis uh, firsthand how much our department's really admired around the state by public health advocates. So uh, I fully agree that there's no one in the country that knows as much about our department and is as prepared to run it as you are. And I'm really appreciative of all your years of service uh, um, behind the scenes. And I'm really glad that you're finally getting the opportunity to serve as director. Um, there's nobody, nobody better prepared. So um, thank you so much for appearing and uh, we'll take this up again formally forthwith. Thank you, Mr. Castle. Thank close. you. Thanks, Rich. Thank you. All right. Now, colleagues, we can take up the consent calendar. Is there a motion to adopt the consent calendar? That's approved. So the calendar. Second. Second. Uh, Council Member Reamer moved. Council Member Juwanda seconds. Uh, I'll just mention quickly, uh, this includes the um, resolution supporting statehood for the District of Columbia. We discussed last, um, last week uh, copiously, but uh, we certainly stand with our neighbors in D.C., over 712,000 residents. Uh, who have been denied uh, their civil rights. Uh, this is an indefensible disenfranchisement of those residents, one of the great civil rights and justices of our time. And I'm really glad that the council is taking decisive action following the lead of the, Metropol the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments in passing that resolution. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor of the consent calendar, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. Okay. Uh, colleagues, I think we can uh, recess until 1.30 for public hearings. Congrats on a good morning's work.